This section discusses the relationship between endothelial function and intermediate thickness. Now we give a separate four-hour presentation on endothelial function, which you're welcome to review. But here I'm going to introduce you to endothelial function as it relates to intermediate thickness. Now, we've already demonstrated that the carotid IMT, to some degree, can differentiate between individuals with flow-restrictive coronary disease and individuals with mild disease. In addition, the greater the IMT parameter, the greater is the likelihood that you'll have multivessel coronary disease as opposed to single vessel disease. However, we've discussed that the coronary angiogram is really no longer the gold or platinum standard. We discussed that carotid artery intermediate thickness relates more tightly to coronary artery intermediate thickness as assessed by the intravascular ultrasound. We know that the coronary angiogram may overestimate or underestimate the severity of a narrowing. We've learned from the intravascular ultrasound studies that actually measure intermediate thickness of the coronary artery that many plaques extend eccentrically into the vessel wall. So what looks like a moderate narrowing is actually a high-grade plaque composed of oxidized cholesterol. We also know that we don't die from a percent narrowing. It is not uncommon for us to see patients who have closed off a coronary artery slowly and silently and we just pick them up on a stress test. You see, you don't die from percent stenosis. You die when vulnerable plaque cracks or ruptures. The most devastating heart attacks occur when a moderate narrowing that is not threatening angiographically cracks or clots because it is vulnerable. Well, what puts the vulnerability into a plaque? Vulnerability of the plaque is not related to the percent stenosis, how severely the artery is narrowed, but it has to do with the physiology, the biochemistry of the endothelium. Vulnerability has to do with endothelial dysfunction, which we're going to talk about. The endothelium are a thin layer of cells that line our great vessels. And it's really an endocrine organ. If you scrape all the endothelial cells off the arteries and veins and lymphatics of the, the vessels in your body, you'll have a massive tissue the size of the liver. So the endothelial cells, they participate in the intermediate thickness assessment. They line the arteries, and they're a biochemical factory that determine our fate. There are individuals with angiographically normal arteries, maybe their IMT would be a little thickened, but they have endothelial dysfunction, and these angiographically normal arteries will narrow and cause the symptoms, vasospastic angina. Individuals with moderate narrowings and intact endothelial function will do well. Individuals with moderate narrowings and a damaged endothelium, where they have disordered biochemistry, this puts the vulnerability into the plaque. These are the individuals who die suddenly with a massive heart attack. They may have had a normal stress test because the stress test won't pick up a 50% narrowing, but because the plaque is vulnerable, but because of endothelial dysfunction, the plaque can crack or fissure or clot and cause a full thickness heart attack. For example, how do we measure endothelial function? What is its significance? Here's an individual that has a coronary angiogram that shows only a modest 20 to 30% narrowing. And then in the cath lab, you inject acetylcholine into the coronary artery. Now, acetylcholine is an endothelium-dependent vasodilator. If the endothelial cells are functioning normally, in response to acetylcholine, you make nitric oxide, and the vessel dilates. Conversely, acetylcholine is an endothelium-independent vasoconstrictor. If you simply inject acetylcholine and the endothelium is not functioning normally, the vessel will spasm. This individual had endothelial dysfunction, with tight vasospasm in response to acetylcholine, this person would have chest pain right in the cath lab because this narrowing, the smooth muscles constricted to cause a high-grade stenosis. So they would inject nitroglycerin into the coronary artery. Nitroglycerin is an endothelium-dependent vasodilator. As a direct chemical effect, it'll vasodilate the artery, and the artery will open up. They didn't do anything to this man. They just brought him back four years later, did a diagnostic angiogram. They did not inject acetylcholine or nitroglycerin, but the angiogram shows progression from a modest narrowing. Now, four years later, there's a tight narrowing. 
In this man, the presence of endothelial dysfunction not only predicted disease progression, it, it pinpointed where the progression would occur because endothelial dysfunction, a physiologic abnormality, precedes and causes anatomic coronary disease presents, per, percent stenosis. Intermediate thickness is the intermediate. We start out with disordered physiology, endothelial dysfunction. That leads to increased intermediate thickness. And intermediate thickness, as we discussed, is the staging ground for plaque. Abnormal physiology, endothelial dysfunction, increased intermediate thickness, and then high-grade anatomic stenosis. Now, how, do we, how can we measure endothelial function? Well, we can inject acetylcholine in your coronary arteries. That's a little awkward. There's some risk. A more appropriate way, and one that lends itself to office assessment of endothelial function, is brachial artery flow media vasodilatation. What we do, we put a blood pressure cuff on your forearm. We measure the diameter of the brachial artery at the elbow with ultrasound. We pump up the cuff to 50 points above your systolic blood pressure for five minutes. So we're going to choke off the arterial blood supply to your arm. That's not going to damage you. You'll be a little bit uncomfortable. Then at five minutes, we release the cuff. Arterial blood will rush into the arterial system. And this will generate a shearing stress against the endothelial cells. The endothelial cells, if you have normal endothelial function, we hope you do, will respond by making nitric oxide and the blood vessel will dilate about 10%. If you have normal endothelial function, you'll have normal brachial artery flow media vasodilatation. And about 250 papers show that what is going on in the arm correlates with what is going on in the coronary arteries and other great vessels. So we can non-invasively and accurately measure endothelial function. And it doesn't matter how we measure endothelial function. It's a systemic phenomenon. And individuals with intact endothelial function do not have events. You are blessed. You may have significant coronary disease, but if your endothelial function is preserved, you are not going to have events. Conversely, the worse your endothelial function, the more likely you are to have an event. Now, how can we improve endothelial function? First, we must understand its biochemistry. The endothelial cells there are chemical factories. They make all sorts of different angiochemicals, vasodilatory, vasoprotective, vasoconstrictive agents. The most important is nitric oxide. Nitric oxide provides the Teflon coating to our blood vessels. It causes the vessels to dilate, to resist spasm and cracking. It keeps the blood platelets from getting sticky. Arginine from our diet or supplements, an amino acid, is converted to nitric oxide by an enzyme called nitric oxide synthase. That is the key function. Now, we talk about endothelial function in a separate for our presentation. And in our book, Reverse Heart Disease Now, there's a section on endothelial function that I'm going to refer you to. When that book came out, my practice changed. I'm seeing patients out of town and in town, many phone calls. What supplements do I take? What do I take for bioenergetic support? What do I take for endothelial dysfunction? That was a lot of work for me, a lot of work for the staff. I was approached by Nutraceutica to make a nutritional supplement to cover the bases that we talk about in the book, Reverse Heart Disease Now, and this is called Ultimate Cardiofusion. And there are components to provide bioenergetic support for individuals with heart failure. We have components for antox and anti-inflammatory approaches, and we cover the bases of endothelial function. This isn't every nutritional supplement you might need, but it's everything that we could put in a liquid supplement to cover the basis of integrative cardiology. Now, when the first batch came across the line, um, it was just in time for my daughter, second lieutenant and second year medical student Catherine and I to run the Cincinnati Flying Pig Marathon. So we took our ultimate cardiofusion before the race. And the marketing guys had this idea that I would cross the finish line wearing the t-shirt with my arms up like this all by myself as if, you know, I won the race. And that was the plan. And I ran a very good race. It was the best race I ran since I was a kid. The problem is, about 50 feet from the finish line, I got a hamstring cramp. So I'm hobbling across the finish line with this horrible grimace of pain on my face. It was like the, the agony of defeat. So that didn't really work well for marketing, but we still had a nice time with the race. And the winners here are my patients and individuals who will take this preparation because it has 
arginine, the raw material that we convert in the endothelial cells to nitric oxide, and many cofactors to stimulate the action of nitric oxide synthase to convert arginine to nitric oxide and antioxidants to protect the nitric oxide from degradation. So we feel that ultimate cardiofusion will help protect the endothelium, and in the future we will do a study of the effect of, of uh, ultimate cardiofusion on brachial artery formative dilatation and carotid artery intermediate thickness. Another biochemical parameter in the endothelium is conversion of angiotensin 1, a readily inactive vasoconstrictor, into angiotensin 2, which is a powerful vasoconstrictor. If we gave you an infusion of angiotensin 2, we could raise your blood pressure enough to give you a stroke. And angiotensin converting enzyme converts the weak angiotensin 1 into the vasoconstrictive plaque former angiotensin 2. Now, we are doing methyl cycle genomic testing in our sickest patients who aren't getting better. We are looking for inherited abnormalities in the methyl cycle, which is basically the backbone of our biochemistry. And in this process, we are looking at a number of genes, including the angiotensin converting enzyme gene. This individual has a homozygous upregulation. Their angiotensin converting enzyme system is upregulated. They are more likely to develop hypertension and cardiovascular disease, and they will respond well to therapies, drug and, and, farm, and um, nutritional, to lower angiotensin to, to improve endothelial function. We also look at the gene for nitric oxide synthase. Some of you have problems genetically making nitric oxide, and you're at greater risk for high blood pressure, vasospasm, heart attack, restenosis after balloon angioplasty. So if we know you have these genomic abnormalities, we'll pay particular attention to endothelial function. Let's talk about blood pressure medicines and intermediate thickness and endothelial function. I'm going to compare angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors with angiotensin receptor blockers. We're going to take 57 subjects with mild to moderate untreated high blood pressure. None had no cardiovascular disease. They had risk factors. A third were smokers, a third were on lipid lowering drugs, a fifth were being treated for type 2 diabetes. And at baseline, you're going to measure their blood pressure, their labs, and the intermediate thickness, the mean thickness of the common carotid artery as we do in the office. Then you're going to randomize these untreated hypertensives to quinapril, which is an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, and losartan, which is an angiotensin receptor blocker. If after two months their blood pressure was not well controlled, you'd switch them to combination therapy to get your blood pressure down. Then you're going to repeat the baseline parameters at one year. And what you find, both drugs were equally effective in lowering the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure. There was no real difference, so you would say one drug does not have an advantage over another. But again, we don't want to just be numbers doctors. We want to lower your blood pressure, we want to lower your sugar, we want to lower your cholesterol, but we want to do it in a fashion that improves your overall biochemistry, that improves endothelial function. Now, quinapril blocks angiotensin converting enzyme. Angiotensin converting enzyme has another function. Here it's called kinase 2. It's one of the same enzyme that it, if we block that enzyme, not only will we block the generation of angiotensin 2, we'll prevent the, bra the breakdown of bradykinin. Bradykinin is a good guy. It helps you make nitric oxide and prostacycline. That's the good stuff you get from fish oils. So theoretically, quinapril has an advantage over the losartan. And if we look at the effect on carotid intermediate thickness after one year, quinapril lowered the IMT from 0.78 to 0.71. That would be 70 points on our scale. Losartan lowered the IMT only 20 points on our scale. Combination therapy was also effective. It wasn't the losartan, the angiotensin II blocker. It was the quinapril. Because by blocking the generation of angiotensin II while preserving um, the bradykinin, you make more nitric oxide, more prostacycline, you protect the endothelium. Again, it's endothelial dysfunction that leads to IMT, soft plaque, which leads to obstructive disease. So we want to lower your blood pressure, but it, 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 it depends on how we lower your blood pressure. If we lower your blood pressure with these tissue-specific angiotensin converting enzymes inhibitors, we're going to lower your blood pressure and lower your plaque burden and improve your outcome. And indeed, in clinical studies, the angiotensin 
um, uh, converting enzymes inhibitors, such as quinapril, do a better job of keeping you out of trouble, decreasing mortality, decreasing event rate, than any other form of blood pressure lowering drug. Diuretics do not improve endothelial function. Calcium blockers do not. And angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors do, and those are our favorite agents. Now let's look at the relationship between the endothelium and intimate media thickness. This is from the cardiovascular risk in senior Italian study. You're going to take 113 overtly healthy middle-aged or senior Italians. Their average age is 62. You're going to record the presence or absence of their standard risk factors. Blood pressure, diabetes, lipids, overweight, smoking, family history, cardiovascular disease. You're going to measure endothelial function, a physiologic parameter, using the brachialarity flow meter vasodilatation. And you're going to measure um, intermediate thickness, a composite mean thickness of the common carotid, the bifurcation, and the internal carotid. We're going to correlate risk factor burden with endothelial function and intermediate thickness. We'll correlate risk factor of burden with physiologic function and saw plaque deposition. Now, amongst these 113 patients, 70% had two or more risk factors, 12% had one risk factor, 17% had no risk factors at all. Now, it's, let's look at endothelial function. In individuals that did not have risk factors, nothing to compromise nitric oxide generation, they vasodilated 10%, which was normal. Those with risk factors, endothelial function was compromised, they vasodilated only 70%. Intermediate thickness was 1.05 millimeters in those with no risk factors, 1.37 in those with risk factors. Risk factors lead to endothelial dysfunction, which you can measure as flow meter vasodilatation, which leads to soft plaque deposition, manifested as an increased intermediate thickness. If we plot increasing intermediate thickness with decreasing flow meter vasodilatation, we see there's a relationship. The worse the endothelial function, the worse the flow meter vasodilatation, the more plaque you are going to have. Now, let's plot flow meter vasodilatation, a marker of improving endothelial function, against intermediate thickness, a marker of increased soft plaque deposition. There's an inverse relationship. Individuals with strong endothelial function, good physiology, have a lower intermediate thickness. Conversely, individuals with impaired endothelial function have a greater soft plaque burden as measured by the intermediate thickness. Individuals with a normal IMT had 10% flow meter vasodilatation. Those that had intermediate thickening by their scale in the carotid or femoral arteries, it was 8%. Those that had increased intermediate thickness in the carotid and femoral arteries, it was 7%. We can measure endothe intermediate thickness in the carotid artery, the femoral artery, any artery we want. It is more convenient and more clinically applicable to use the carotid artery, and that's what we focus on. Now, this slide, I, I like everyone to pay attention. I think everybody will. It is very easy for me to convince women to take steps to improve their health. Men don't want to listen to me. They feel fine. They're okay. Why should they take their vitamins? But everybody, I think, will pay attention to the content of this slide. We're going to look at intermediate thickness, erectile dysfunction, and the response to Cialis. We're going to take 60 men with organic endothelial dysfunction. This means it was a physiologic problem, not a psychogenic problem. They're aged 60, 70 years, stable couple relationship, Six to 12 month history of ED, there's a scale, a questionnaire scale, the IEF, and they all had low scores. They did not have known cardiovascular disease or standard risk factors. They didn't have hypertension, they weren't smokers, they weren't diabetics, they didn't have cardiovascular disease, at least cardiovascular disease they knew of, but they had ED. The comparison group are going to be 30 younger men with psychogenic ED. There was nothing wrong with their plumbing, they were under stress or they were depressed. That was their problem, the reason they had um, erectile dysfunction. None are on phosphodiesterase inhibitors. That is the generic name for Viagra, Cialis, etc. The baseline evaluation, you do the NPTRM. This is the nocturnal penile tumescence and rigidity monitoring. One wears a device that measures nocturnal activities and then use a Doppler technique to measure blood flow in the penile artery and you're going to measure carotid artery mean IMT. 
you're going to treat all the men with Cialis 20 milligrams every other day. Now normally you use Cialis and Viagra as needed, but in this study they, they had men take it every other day whether they wanted to use it or not. The idea was could there be a therapeutic effect of taking Cialis every other day for three months. You had them do that for three months. And how do, how do these drugs work? Well, you know, erectile dysfunction is really endothelial dysfunction. If you have erectile dysfunction, it means you've got cardiovascular disease or you're going to get cardiovascular disease because the problem is not enough blood flow. Either obstructed blood flow, blocked arteries in the pelvis, or you can't make nitric oxide. You need nitric oxide to vasodilate. You need nitric oxide to develop and maintain an erection. The drugs, the Cialis, the Viagra drugs, what they do is they block, de they block the breakdown of nitric oxide. The problem is you're not making enough nitric oxide. You're making some, and these drugs block the breakdown. It's not actually nitric oxide, but it's a second messenger called cyclic GMP. That's how these drugs work by maintaining levels of nitric oxide when you're having trouble making your own. So intuitively it does make sense that persistent therapy with, with these phosphodiesterase drugs might bathe you in nitric oxide and improve blood flow. So they had the men take Cialis every other day for three months and then they stopped the Cialis and then four weeks later you reevaluate to see if three months of Cialis had a benefit. Now, the men, the younger men, the 30-year-old men with psychogenic erectile dysfunction, um, all of them had a normal intermediate thickness. Of the older men, the 60-plus-year-old men, a third had normal intermediate thickness, 25% had increased IMT, and 42% had a markedly increased IMT of above 1.3. So they had various degrees of soft plaque deposition. And we know that soft plaque deposition, as assessed by the carotid artery, is predictive of obstructive disease elsewhere. Penile artery systolic blood flow was normal at 63 in the younger men. They had intact plumbing. In the older men, with a normal IMT, blood flow was nearly normal. In the men with some increase in IMT, it was less. The men with severe intermediate thickening had the worst blood flow. That makes sense because increased IMT correlates with obstructive disease elsewhere. Now, in response to three months of Cialis and then you reevaluate one month later, the younger men with psychogenic ED, they were, their blood flow was normal to begin with, it stayed normal. The men, the older men with organic ED that had preserved IMT, their blood flow improved basically up to normal. The men with a mild increase in IMT, blood flow improved, not quite to normal, but it did improve. The men with a, a heavily thickened IMT, blood flow did not improve. If you look at the number of erections a man would experience overnight, normal is five. The men with psychogenic ED, they were having the normal five erections because their problem was not organic, and they had a few more, that they were still normal. The men, the older men with organic ED that had normal IMT, their number of erections improved. The men with a mild to moderate increase in IMT, they improved. The men with an increased IMT did not improve. Same thing with the time to increase, to develop the erection and the rigidity of the erection. These physiologic markers of erectile function adequacy improved in response to Cialis in men that did not have significantly increased intermediate thickness. But in the men with increased intermediate thickness, Cialis therapy was not as effective. Now, we're not really concerned about penile artery blood flow rates and phenomena like that. We're concerned with our function. Two-thirds of the younger men returned to normal sexual function. And again, their problem was stress or depression and they got over that and got better. Two-thirds of the men with organic ED who were treated with Cialis for three months, those that did not have abnormal intermediate thickening got better. Normal sexual activity was resumed in two-thirds of those men, certainly a plus. 
in the men with a mild to moderate increase in IMT, half return to normal sexual function. In the men with an increased IMT, only 16% improved. So gentlemen, you may be 40 or 50 and you feel great and you're not all that excited about taking your vitamins and lowering your homocysteine, etc. But if we work with you now, when you're 60, 70, 80, you're less likely to have problems with ED and I hope that motivates everybody. Can the endothelium protect the intima media from damage? We, we've made this point that physiologic abnormalities causing endothelial dysfunction lead to increased intermediate thickness, the staging ground for plaque, leading to obstructive disease, ED, cardiovascular disease, and stroke. If the endothelium is intact, can it protect against soft plaque accumulation in the intermediate? We're going to look at the cardiovascular risk in young fin studies. We're going to get, we're going to look at just over 2,100 healthy young fins. You're going to measure their standard risk factors at ages 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, and 18 years of age. As young adults around age 25 to 40, you're going to measure the risk factors again, the mean intermediate thickness of the common carotid artery, and endothelial function, brachial artery flow media visitation. And you're going to correlate childhood risk factor burden with adult intermediate thickness and adult brachial artery flow media vasodilatation. Childhood risk factor burden with adult soft plaque deposition, adult physiology, endothelial function. Now, you're going you're gonna to measure the endothelial function and you're going to stratify these 40-year-olds into deciles, 10% brackets. Those in the lower 10%, they had impaired endothelial function and they, they vasodilated only 1%. In the top 10%, they were considered to have enhanced endothelial function. They vasodilated 16%. And then the 80% of individuals in between had intermediate endothelial function. Let's look at adult intermediate thickness in relation to childhood risk factors, the number of risk factors, and adult endothelial function. Individuals who, um, as adults, had enhanced endothelial function, they vasodilated well, it didn't matter whether they had none, one, or two or more risk factors as kids, the fact that they had well-preserved endothelial function protected them from the risk factors. So their IMT measurement is small. Individuals with impaired endothelial function, the more risk factors they had as kids, the more soft plaque was present as adults. And the same situation in those in the 80% with intermediate endothelial function, the more risk factors, the more plaque. If we look at adult IMT related to adult risk factors and adult endothelial function, the same relationship. If you're an adult and you have risk factors, but for whatever reason, your endothelium is preserved, the risk factors will not harm you. I'm going to repeat that. If you have a number of risk factors as an adult, but we can preserve your endothelial function, you will be readily immune from the deleterious effects of the risk factors. You will not have an increased IMT. And if you do not have an increased IMT, you're less likely to have obstructive disease elsewhere in cardiovascular events. However, if endothelial function is impaired, the more risk factors you have, the more plaque will be deposited in your great vessels, the greater is your risk for an adverse event. How can we improve endothelial function in individuals with risk factors? How do risk factors cause endothelial dysfunction? Now, we take up arginine from diet or supplements and convert it to nitric oxide. Now, we want to make a lot of nitric oxide, but we can't have too much nitric oxide. Otherwise, our blood pressure would be too low. Or if we nicked ourselves shaving, we would bleed because nitric oxide keeps the platelets from sticking. So we need to have a control mechanism. Mother Nature works with ratios, not absolute values. We have ADMA, which is asymmetric dimethyl arginine. It is made at a constant rate, and it's broken down by an enzyme called DDAH. And it's the ratio of arginine to ADMA, the arginine to ADMA ratio, that determines how much nitric oxide is being made. Now, the ADMA is made at a constant rate, and it's broken down. All the risk factors that cause cardiovascular disease, smoking, diabetes, 
hyperlipidemia, homocysteine work by blocking the activity of DDAH, the enzyme that breaks down ADMA. All the risk factors as a final common pathway keep you from breaking down ADMA. The more risk factors you have, the more ADMA you have. The lower will be your arginine to ADMA ratio, the less nitric oxide you'll make. Well, we understand this. So if we have patients with risk factors, we will try to eliminate the risk factors. Exercise, lose weight, stop smoking, let's lower your blood sugar, we'll lower your cholesterol. But if we cannot, and for extra assurance, we will supplement you with arginine and the cofactors that stimulate the conversion of arginine to nitric oxide, and we'll give you antioxidants to prevent the breakdown of nitric oxide. We will be working deeper to the risk factors. We will be, at least in part, neutralizing the effects of risk factors. And it has been shown in multiple studies in my cardiology journals that arginine supplementation in individuals with or without risk factors improves endothelial function, improves cardiac performance, and is protective. So I want to lower your risk factors, but really what I want to do is optimize endothelial function. Because if I can preserve and optimize endothelial function, I will, at least in part, neutralize the disease-producing effect of your risk factors. Ultimate Cardiofusion, which we design to fill many needs, but especially to improve endothelial function, contains arginine, the cofactors needed to convert arginine to nitric oxide, and antioxidants needed to preserve nitric oxide so generated. Let's look at ADMA. ADMA is a bad guy. The more ADMA you have, the lower your arginine to ADMA ratio, the less nitric oxide, the less nitric oxide, the worse your endothelial function. With endothelial dysfunction, you're going to layer out soft plaque. You're going to have increased IMT and an increased event risk. In this study, we're going to look at 7 or 12 um, residents of a farming community in Japan, 610 men, 882 women, all above 40 years of age. You're going to look at their standard risk factors, their ADMA levels, their mean common carotid IMT, and we're going to correlate ADMA, a biochemical marker or predictor of endothelial dysfunction, with the common carotid artery mean IMT. Now, individuals with low ADMA had low IMT. As the ADMA level rises, so does the IMT. ADMA is a marker of endothelial dysfunction. Endothelial dysfunction, you have increased IMT. Abnormal physiology predicts and causes abnormal anatomy via the mechanism of increased intermediate thickness, soft plaque deposition. You can do an analysis looking for independent determinants of an increased IMT, advancing age, high blood pressure, male gender, blood pressure medications, and ADMA were important predictors of an increased IMT. And that makes sense because ADMA is a reflection of the sum total deleterious effects of all of your risk factors. So it makes sense. The higher your ADMA, the worse your endothelial function, the greater will be your IMT. Now, when I got involved in preventative cardiology 15 years ago, we talked about risk factors. These are the abnormalities in vascular biochemistry and cell biology that cause cardiovascular disease. But really, they're not just causing cardiovascular disease, they're causing endothelial dysfunction and they're causing increased IMT. We're dealing with the same process here. The initial manifestations of the plaque that's going to kill you is endothelial dysfunction due to your risk factors or genetics. It will manifest itself as impaired flow media vasodilatation and then as increased IMT and then as obstructive lesions and as events. So we're going to look at all these abnormalities that want to damage your physiology, layer out soft plaque, and then lead to high-grade lesions, vulnerable plaques, and cardiovascular events. In this slide, we list all the factors that I found in the literature to be associated with an increased IMT and an increased rate of IMT progression, as well as all the therapies that have been shown to stabilize or regress IMT. And guess what? These are all the factors that cause endothelial dysfunction, all the factors that cause cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular events. It's all different stages of the disease process. 
And the earlier we work, and the more basic the level that we work, the better off will you do. So to summarize this section on the link between endothelial function and carotid IMT, endothelial function is the most important predictor of short, intermediate, and long-term outcome. All the risk factors for cardiovascular disease cause endothelial dysfunction. So I want to identify and remove or neutralize your risk factors because I know that if you have endothelial dysfunction, it leads to and drives forward an increased IMT. And an increased IMT predicts current level of plaque deposition and future plaque status. Again, the IMT is the staging ground for obstructive plaque. The greater your IMT, the greater your risk of blockages and events. Now, an intact endothelium will protect against the risk factors. So I'm going to address endothelial function independent of and deep to the risk factors. Thus, the risk factors are less likely to cause abnormal physiology. They're less likely to cause soft plaque deposition IMT. And if we can block soft plaque deposition, if we can shut down the plaque producing factory, we can decrease your risk of adverse cardiovascular events. And we discuss endothelial function in detail in reverse heart disease now and on my website, heartfixer.com, and I refer you to those resources for additional information. That concludes the section on endothelial dysfunction. Now we're going to move on to the section covering other factors that predict IMT progression. This section of our presentation discusses other factors above and beyond endothelial dysfunction that predict progression of intermediate thickness. Now, it's important that doctors like myself stand on correct principles, that we do the right thing for the right reason, irrespective of what other healthcare providers or insurance companies want us to do. But while it's important that we stand on our principles, it may, be, it may not be a good idea to stand on your principles while you're standing up. Let's examine what happens when you stand up quickly. Blood's going to pool in your lower extremities. To maintain blood pressure, your adrenal glands and your vasculature will release adrenaline and noradrenaline to constrict your blood vessels and your heart rate and heart contractility will pick up and there will be a shearing stress within the carotid arteries, especially at branch points. And we discussed that plaque deposition is typically greater in the bifurcation and in the internal carotid artery than in the common carotid artery. This has to do with nonlinear shearing stress and turbulent flow. So standing up and maintaining the upright posture in theory could lead to endothelial dysfunction and plaque deposition. Let's examine the relationship between work posture and intermediate thickness. Here we're going to look at 584 employed men who were participating in the Quopio ischemic heart disease study done by Dr. Salonen and his colleagues. At baseline, you're going to record the mean maximal IMT of the common carotid artery, the presence or absence of smaller stenotic plaques, and stenotic plaque in their uh, criteria is a 20% narrowing, and how much you stand at work. Very much, a lot, a little, or not at all, and other work-related characteristics that might play a role in IMT deposition uh, such as is your job physical or sedentary, work stress and support, and social economic status. And you're going to look at standard risk factors. You're going to repeat the IMT at four years, and you're going to correlate the rate of IMT or soft plaque uh, deposition progression with work posture corrected for other phenomena that might play a role, other standard risk factors. Now, 80 of the men did not stand at all. They had a purely desk job. And their baseline maximal uh, IMT was 0.9. Men who stood a little bit were 0.91. Men who stood a lot were 0.93 and very much 0.93. So individuals that have jobs where they're standing started off the study with a greater IMT than men that had purely desk jobs. 
if we look at progression of IMT, and of course we're more worried about the rate of progression of IMT than your baseline IMT. If we adjust for age, individuals who stood very much progressed 0.34 millimeters as opposed to men that had purely desk jobs, 0.24, and those who uh, stood a little had, had, had intermediate levels. If we adjust for work heaviness, for psychosocial factors such as anxiety and depression and socioeconomic status, and if we adjust for standard risk factors, diabetes, hypertension, and smoking, we show that individuals who stand at work, not only did they start with a greater IMT, their IMT progressed more rapidly than individuals with desk jobs. Now, individuals who did not have any plaque present at baseline, they progressed more rapidly if they stood constantly at work. Individuals who did have plaque also progressed more rapidly. Individuals who did not have known cornea disease were more likely to develop cornea disease if they stood at work because their IMT progressed more rapidly. But particularly dangerous, individuals with known cardiovascular disease who stood all the time at work progressed 0.75 millimeters. That is a tremendous amount of IMT progression. So the standing posture activates the sympathetic nervous system causing endothelial dysfunction, abnormal shearing stress, and is associated with an increased rate of IMT progression. And this is a particular problem if you have known cardiovascular disease. So if you have known cardiovascular disease, I'm going to recommend that you get a desk job because standing at work activating the sympathetic nervous system is compromising endothelial function and it's leading to an increased rate of soft plaque deposition. Medical radiation and IMT. We had a patient whose life was saved with therapeutic radiation. He had a lymphoma in his chest. The lymphoma was put in remission by radiation therapy. Ten years later he comes in with chest pain. We do a heart cath and all of his arteries were diffusely narrowed. This wasn't atherosclerosis, it was radiation fibrosis. And we couldn't do a bypass or an angioplasty because it wasn't plaque. The only thing that would help this man was hyperbaric oxygen. Because hyperbaric oxygen saturates the blood with a high level of oxygen that will diffuse into the heart muscle independent of blood flow. And of interest, I'm going to take the hyperbaric oxygen course this fall and we're going to have a hyperbaric therapy unit here in the office because we can improve oxygen supply to your internal organs above and beyond improving blood flow. Well this man um, did respond quite well to hyperbaric therapy. Here we have a study of 36 men with head and neck squamous cell carcinoma and we're going to do a carotid ultrasound. We're going to measure the IMT, the best view, and we're going to look at peak flow velocity in the presence or absence of visible plaque. And then they are going to have their head and neck malignancy addressed with an appropriate dose of radiation therapy. One year post radiation we're going to repeat the IMT and then in the survivors we're going to repeat it at two years. Now typically symptomatic vascular disease occurs 10 to 15 years following radiation therapy. That is in the literature that's been my clinical experience and the few patients I've had that have had radiation therapy. I had one man who had radiation therapy to the neck and he had high grade disease in his carotid arteries and his coronaries were crystal clear because it was the radiation that led to the atherosclerosis. Now if it takes 10 to 15 years for radiation to cause obstructive disease, let's now look at the relationship between radiation and intermediate thickness because intermediate thickness precedes and causes obstructive disease. These men, at one year, the IMT in their right and left carotid artery increased dramatically, 170 points. Between years one and years two, it also progressed. So radiation is damaging the endothelium, leading to increased IMT, which predicts obstructive disease down the road. Now, I make a living as an invasive cardiologist, and I've done a lot of heart catheterizations. And the reason I got interested in IMT, I was at a meeting and they had the IMT scanner and we all stood in line to get our IMTs done and I'm this 52 year old marathon runner who takes vitamins they were expecting to see these really good arteries and the guy gave me a funny look and wasn't quite sure what to say 
So I became concerned and we obtained our own unit and this, these are my IMT scores and you can see on the right my numbers are a lot better than on the left. They're much greater on the left. Now isn't that odd? Why should one artery be worse than another? And I don't know if you can see it here, here's my right carotid, here's my left, the IMT is much greater on the left. Now this is the type of report that I prepare for my patients, so I decided to repair one from, prepare one for myself. My left carotid IMT is at the 50th to 75th percentile. On the right, I'm at the 25th percentile, which you would kind of anticipate in a relatively young marathon runner. Now, when I do heart catheterizations, I'm standing, which of course isn't very good, and I'm exposed to radiation. We wear a thyroid shield around our neck to shield our thyroid gland from radiation, but it doesn't cover the carotid artery. So I'm standing like this, and here's the radiation, so my left carotid artery is being exposed to radiation, whereas my right is being shielded by my neck. Now, when we do heart catheterizations, we're supposed to wear these little radiation detectors on our waist and on our neck. And when I first started in cardiology, I basically lived in the hospital. I did a lot, an awful lot of evasive procedures. And in the cath lab, I wore my little badges because that's what the nurses told me to do and I'm supposed to go along with the guidelines. And I'd get these letters at the end of every month. Dr. Roberts, the Radiation Safety Committee has found that you've been exposed to a greater than desirable amount of radiation. You need to take steps to minimize your radiation exposure or we won't let you do heart catheterizations anymore. So I kept getting these letters and they were getting a little bit more nasty each time. So my solution was to stop wearing the badge and then they stopped writing the letters. Great. And for every heart cath I did wearing the badge, I did two or three invasive procedures in the CCU where I was exposed to radiation. So this was incredibly stupid, but you know, when you're young, you're, you feel you're invulnerable, you do stupid things. So I've been exposed to way too much radiation and the price I'm paying is increased IMT on the left and, and I'm a little bit protected on the right. So my advice to myself is to keep working hard to keep your patients out of the hospital as doing these heart catheterizations is not good for you. So I'm gonna work hard to keep you healthy because I don't really wanna do any more of these heart catheterizations. And this of course might make me anxious, worrying about my own mortality and what effects anxiety you're gonna have on IMT. We're gonna look at 726 individuals called from the voter registration in Nantes, France 59 to 71 years old without known cardiovascular disease. At baseline, you're gonna assess their level of anxiety. There's a questionnaire, the Spielberger inventory, that looks at your levels of anxiety. You're gonna do the mean common carotid IMT, and you're gonna look at for the presence of plaque, and they define that as an IMT above one millimeter in the common carotid, the bifurcation, or the internal carotid. You're gonna repeat the baseline measures at two years. They define sustained anxiety as individuals in the top 10% on the anxiety score at baseline and at two years. You're gonna repeat the IMT in four years, correlate the four year change in IMT with one's anxiety status. And what you find, if you're just looking at the baseline IMT, men with versus men without anxiety, no difference, no real difference in women. But if we look at the yearly progression, men who were anxious progressed at 20 points a year versus men who were not anxious at 10 points per year. Women, women with anxiety progressed twice as rapidly as women who did not have lots of anxiety. If we look at individuals if, at baseline, men who were anxious, 35% had visible plaque versus 23% of the men who were not anxious. No difference in women. If we look at new plaque deposition over four years in individuals that did not have any baseline plaque, those who were anxious, 37% developed plaque versus men who were not anxious, 17%. This makes sense because those who were anxious had a greater increase in IMT. IMT is the staging ground for plaque, so of course they're gonna have more plaque. Individuals who had plaque at baseline, baseline disease, they progressed at a greater rate of new plaque deposition versus those that were free of plaque. But again, the men who are anxious, 63% developed new plaque 
or extensive, an extension of plaque versus 35% of the men who are not anxious. So anxiety is associated with an increased rate of IMT progression and an increased rate of new plaque progression. So we don't want you to be anxious. How do we deal with anxiety? Well, we give a presentation on how to deal with anxiety. You want to recognize what is bothering you and take steps that you can to eliminate the anxiety. Running, stress reduction, biofeedback. We have a neat new program of biofeedback that I want to discuss with you briefly. This is our Clear Mind program. Our brain waves are constantly cycling between fast activity beta waves and when we're deep in sleep, we're down here in delta. When we're drowsy, we're in theta. When we're relaxing on idle, we're in alpha. When we're thinking, when we're stimulated, we're in beta. People who are chronically anxious, people that can't slow down their minds, they can't fall asleep, they're stuck in beta. People who are depressed, who can't get motivated, they're stuck down here. Individuals with ADD in their frontal lobe, the executive regions, they're stuck down in alpha, they can't get up into beta, so they have to go from thing to thing to thing or engage in risky behaviors to get a little bit of beta stimulation. If you're having trouble with your golf swing, it may be that you're having trouble slowing down brain waves and relaxing in the motor strip in your brain. If you're ringing it, if there, you have ringing in the ear, in your right ear, it's because that area of the brain may be stuck in beta. We have mo all, every Every neurologic function is represented in our brain, and we can put electrodes over the scalp corresponding to the region of interest in the brain and see, are we stuck? Are we stuck in alpha? Are we stuck in beta? Or do we have the normal cycling? Now, many of us will develop bad work habits. We will use one area of our brain and ignore another. It was expedient and convenient at some point, but it's not physiologic and normal. So we have a program with the neurobiofeedback called the optimizer that samples the activity in the brain and if one area is slow and one area is fast, we want to balance things out. So what we're doing, we're monitoring your brain waves and we're supposed to see a normal fluctuation up and down. And what we'll do if, if the pattern's not normal, and it's rarely normal in, in, in adults because life is not always easy. And we will shine lights in your eyes of various colors and try to entrain the area of interest in the brain to fire at a certain frequency. And we're monitoring your EKG, EEG with the electrodes over your scalp. Now, when the brain cooperates and starts firing in the desirable range, you get to listen to music and look at pretty pictures. If your brain is not cooperating and still firing too fast or too slow outside of the desired range, we cut off the music. It's very irritating. You're listening to Beethoven and we cut it off and you're irritated. Well, you, you can't tell your brain, speed up, slow down, just as you can't say, I want my blood pressure to go up and down. But your brain does want you to listen to the music and the brain gets the message and begins to fire in the desired range. And with each session, we tighten up the parameters and train your brain to fire within the desired range. Now, if you're chronically anxious, you're stuck in beta, we will, we will reward you when you slow down. If you're depressed and you're st stuck in alpha, we'll reward you when you go to beta. So you have a series of these treatments over a period of time and you retrain your brain. Now every drug for psychological disease, they affect your neurotransmitters inevitably to affect your brain waves. If you're hyper, you can't fall asleep and you're stuck in beta, we can give you a Valium or you can take a drink and that'll slow down your brain waves. If you have ADD or you're depressed, they give you medicines that you might call uppers to increase neurotransmitters and increase your brain waves. But why take a drug when you can do biofeedback to rectify your brain waves? So this is a wonderful treatment for anxiety. Actually, a colleague and I went on a field trip to see this work and I had it done on myself and I didn't really think anything of it. It was kind of pleasant. And a week later, I'm back here in the office and at the end of the week, the staff comes up and goes, you know, Dr. Roberts, what did she do to you? What do you mean? Things happened this week. Insurance companies didn't pay you. You had problems. Things that normally get you mad, and they didn't get you mad. Oh, I had the clear mind, and they said, we like you this way. Go buy one. So we did. So this has been a lot of fun for us. Optimism. 
Will optimism protect against cardiovascular disease? We're going to look at 209 participants in the HWS, the Healthy Women Study. These are healthy premenopausal women, age 42 through 50. And at the beginning of the study, before menopause, they undergo the life orientation test, which is a measurement of optimism, pessimism. Ten years later, five years post-menopause, you repeat the life orientation test and you measure the, the mean and the mean maximal IMT and the common carotid, the bifurcation, the internal carotid. You carry out a second IMT three years later, eight years post-menopause, and correlate optimism, pessimism with IMT progression. Now, let's look at IMT progression over the first three years of the study. On the first scan, it's 0.77. Second scan, it's 0.8. That's 10 points a year, similar to the rate of progression in otherwise healthy Americans. The mean maximal progressed at 2% over three years, which is consistent with normal healthy Americans. Now, let's look at the three-year IMT progression as a function of optimism, pessimism. Individuals who are the most optimistic, the upper quartile, the upper 25% for optimism progressed 1.3%. The group means 5%, they're more pessimistic colleagues were progressing at 5 to 6 percent. Same relationship with the maximal IMT. If we look at individuals who are in the lowest um, quartile for uh, pessimism or the greatest quartile for optimism on both studies, those who were chronically pessimistic over three years progressed their mean at 6.5 percent and their mean maximum at 4.5%. Those who are optimistic progressed their mean at only 1.5%. Their mean maximal did not progress. So optimism is protective. Pessimism increases the risk of IMT progression. Let's look at socioeconomic status. We're going to look at 122 men participate in the Quolpio ischemic heart disease study. And they looked at individuals ages 42, 48, 54, and 60. At baseline, you're going to do a carotid ultrasound, measure the mean and the mean maximal carotid IMT. You're going to look at socioeconomic status, a compilation of income, education, occupation, and material goods, standard risk factors. You're going to repeat the ultrasound four years later and correlate the change in IMT with socioeconomic status, and you can correct for differences in other risk factors. Now, four-year IMT progression versus education. In blue, we have mean. In red, we have the mean maximal. Individuals who completed high school, a greater level of education had less progression than individuals with some high school or grade school only. If we look at income, we divide the men into quartiles of income. You can see that mean and mean maximal IMT progressed more slowly in individuals with a high income versus individuals with a lower income. So the moral of the story here is stay in school, get a desk job, make enough money so you're not anxious that you can be optimistic, and above all, don't do heart catheterizations for a living. We've been talking about IMT, risk factors, endothelial dysfunction, and cardiovascular disease. Let's now talk about the relationship between IMT and kidney disease. And this is appropriate because the kidney is really a vascular organ. The kidney filters the blood through a vascular sieve. Risk factors that cause endothelial dysfunction cause problems in the vascular sieve. Free radical stress causes endothelial dysfunction, cardiovascular disease, and kidney disease. So it is reasonable to look at the link between IMT and kidney disease. This is data from the INVADE study, Intervention Project of Cerebral Vascular Disease and Dementia. You're going to look at um, just over 3,300 subjects who lived in Ebensburg, Germany, and all their records were easily accessible because they received um, health care via the Algemeine Oxtrascansi insurance company, otherwise known as AOK. -OK. And they're all 55 years of age, living in the same community, and their records are all being kept by the AOK -OK insurance company. At study entry, you're going to look at the mean common carotid IMT, risk factors for cardiovascular disease and kidney disease, which are pretty much the same, 
and an assessment of kidney function called GFR or glomerular filtration rate. Ideal is 100. Kidney disease is down to 60. Everyone else is, is in between. So you're going to measure GFR and assessment of kidney function. Two years later, you're going to repeat the IMT. One year after that, three years later, you're going to assess event rate. You're going to correlate kidney function with two-year IMT progression, and it actually is four-year clinical outcome. Now, we're going to divide the subjects into quartiles of kidney function. The, the lower quartile was below 64. That would correlate with a creatinine of 1.1. That's the lab marker that we use. Individuals in the upper quartile, they're nearly perfect. They're above 89. Their creatinine is 0.7. And if we look at baseline carotid IMT as a function of, of quartile of kidney function, individuals with the lowest level of kidney function have a greater IMT than individuals with more perfect or lower limit of normal kidney function. So your kidney function is associated with an increased IMT. Now, here we have baseline IMT versus baseline kidney function. We look at the two-year progression of IMT is far greater in those with worse kidney function. Those in the lower quartile of kidney function progressed at um, 22 points. Those with the most well-preserved kidney function progressed at only 9 points. So kidney dysfunction is associated with a relative increase in IMT. Kidney dysfunction is associated with a greater rate of change of IMT. And we shouldn't be surprised because the kidney is a vascular organ. So IMT will predict progression of kidney disease. We'll get into that in another section. Kidney disease predicts progression of IMT. Most patients with chronic kidney disease don't die of kidney disease, they die of cardiovascular disease because kidney disease leads to cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular disease leads to kidney disease. The median baseline GFR level of kidney function was 75. The median two-year IMT progression was 80 points. Event rate was greatest in those with below average kidney function and below average IMT progression. Event rate was least in those with above midline kidney function and below midline line IMT progression. Homocysteine. Homocysteine is a breakdown product of protein metabolism. Homocysteine is also a component of the methyl cycle, which we'll talk about a little bit later. When we do genomic testing, we are looking at not just angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor and nitric oxide synthase, but all the enzymes that play a role in homocysteine metabolism. An elevated homocysteine is associated with an increased risk of all forms of cardiovascular disease, all forms of neurologic disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and miscarriage. An elevated homocysteine is associated with so many different disease states because it is a reflection of abnormal methyl cycle function, abnormal methyl cycle genomics. Here we're going, to dis we're going to look at the relationship between homocysteine and IMT. This is the cutest study, the Perth Carotid Ultrasound Disease Assessment Study. We're going to look at just over a thousand subjects, mean age 52, who, who are residing in Perth, Australia. You'll measure their serum homocysteine, their mean common carotid IMT, the group mean was 0.71, the 80th percentile, the upper 20% cutoff was above 0.8. So they called that abnormal. Presence or absence of focal plaque here and IMT above one. Here are the quartiles of IMT in men and in women. Men have higher homocysteines on average than women. One of the reasons men have more cardiovascular disease than women. If we look at the subjects, the percentage with an abnormally increased IMT, the upper quintile, um, above 0.8. It's really low in those with low homocysteines, men and women, but in the men and women in the upper quartile of homocysteine, they have greater IMTs. Percentage of, of a plaque, visible plaque, of course, is also low in those with low homocysteines. It's high in those with high homocysteines. 
Homocysteine causes endothelial dysfunction, so of course it's going to lead to increased IMT, and the IMT is going to lead to increased plaque deposition. Um, here we're going to look at the ERIC study, the atherosclerosis risk uh, in community study done in America. We're going to select from the 15,800 subjects 287 with an IMT above the 90th percentile, the worst 10%, and then for comparison we're going to take individuals who were below the 75th percentile, more favorable IMT, none with known cardiovascular disease. Now the high IMT crowd, the top 10%, their maximal IMT was above 2.5 on one side or 1.6 on both sides. Those at the 70th percentile or below were much better below one. You're going to measure their fasting homocysteine, correlate homocysteine with their IMT. And what you find, the cases, the top 10%, their mean IMT is 1.2. Those that were at the 75th percentile or better are just half as much at 0.63. Those with a high IMT have a much higher homocysteine than those with a less severe uh, IMT. If we look at the relative risk of, a high, of being in the high IMT versus the low IMT group, as a function of the increase in quintiles of homocysteine, if you are in the upper 20% for homocysteine, that's just above 10.2, and most of my new patients are above 10.2, you're 3.2 times as likely to have a high IMT as if you're six or below. So I, high IMT is an important risk factor for cardiovascular disease, endothelial dysfunction, high IMT, increased plaque deposition, increased event rate. Homocysteine is a sulfur-containing amino acid. It's a methyl cycle intermediate. It's associated with neurologic disease, cardiovascular disease. Levels typically fall in response to B vitamin supplementation, but the clinical effects of B vitamin supplementations have been variable. We'll get into that a little bit later. Vitamin D. Vitamin D is critically important. It is rare for, for me to see a new patient that does not have a low vitamin D level. Just about everybody in the Midwest is low in vitamin D. Low vitamin D is associated with a multitude of disease states, from heart disease to, to, to diabetes to malignancy. Supplementation has been shown to be of great value. My typical patient requires four to 6,000 international units of vitamin D a day to maintain a physiologic level. This is a study of 720 middle-aged Italians seen in the clinic during the winter months. You know, we really get vitamin D from the sun, so our vitamin D levels are going to be lower in the winter, which is one of the reasons we have more infection, more heart attacks in the winter. Anyways, we're going to look at 360 with adult onset type 2 diabetes, 360 non-diabetics, age and gender matched. The diabetics have lower vitamin D levels than do the non-diabetics. Hypovitaminosis D, low vitamin D, they defined at below 38, that was present in, in uh, a third of the diabetics versus only 16% of the controls. So low vitamin D is associated with diabetes. Insulin sensitivity, the ability to lower your blood sugar normally improves with vitamin D supplementation. Low vitamin D, poor insulin insensitivity, of course you're more likely to become diabetic. Um, of the diabetics, those with low vitamin D, their hemoglobin A1Cs, which is the three-month running average of sugar control, was greater. Their fibrinogen was greater. Their blood fibrinogen, the precursor of fibrin clot, it makes your blood more viscous, and they had a higher C-reactive protein. So low vitamin D, your sugar's higher, your blood is more viscous, more inflammation. If we looked at independent um, Contrib the parameters that were independently associated with an increased IMT, they were age, male gender, smoking, fibrinogen, and the only thing that was protective was vitamin D. Individuals with normal vitamin D have a IMT of 0.87, those with low vitamin D much higher, 1.1. So we want to keep your vitamin D levels within the physiologic range. Adiponectin, I don't think you've heard of adiponectin before, I just learned about it recently. 225 consecutive men undergoing angiography with a high grade 70% narrowing. The comparison group are 225 clinic patients free of known cardiovascular disease. You're going to measure their standard risk factors and their adiponectin levels. The healthy individuals in white had higher adiponectin levels than those with cardiovascular disease. Your relative risk for cardiovascular disease, if your adiponectin was low, 
in the first quartile versus if it was high in the fourth quartile was 2.1. So low adiponectin is associated with the dramatically increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So what the heck is adiponectin? It is an adipose tissue or fat cell derived plasma protein. Adiponectin accumulates within the intima, which we're measuring in our intermediate thickness assessment, of a stressed or biochemically injured artery. It blocks white cell adhesion to the endothelium, blocks foam cell formation, anti-inflammatory effect, blocks smooth muscle cell migration. These are all the physiologic abnormalities that lead to plaque. Adiponectin prevents plaque deposition. Your adiponectin levels are inversely related to your body fat burden, especially visceral or abdominal fat. Adiponectin levels rise when you lose weight. So one of the physiologic mechanisms that link weight reduction to improve cardiovascular health is you're making a lot of adiponectin. In a previous section, we talked about how raloxifene, a selective estrogen receptor blocker, decreases the rate of IMT progression in postmenopausal women. One of the biochemical effects of raloxifene was to raise adiponectin. So one of, one of the reasons we encourage exercise and weight loss is when you're burning fat, when you're losing fat stores, your adiponectin levels rise and that has an anti-plaque effect. HDL cholesterol. We all, we've been talking about how a high LDL, the bad or the lousy cholesterol, is associated with an increased IMT. Now let's talk about the HDL, which is the protective lipid particle. HDL is involved in reverse cholesterol transport. It takes extra cholesterol out of the arteries, out of the body, uh, th via the liver. Let's look at the relationship between HDL and IMT. Hypoalpha lipoproteinemia is our term for low HDL. In this study, those who are in the lower 10% for age and gender. Why would you have a low HDL? Well, there's acquired causes such as diabetes, overweight, lack of exercise, high carb diet, and there are genetic abnormalities in um, uh, less than cholesterol, acyl transferase, lipoprotein lipase, other biochemical um, phenomenon that are under genetic control that would lower your HDL. Then we have people with what we call hyperalpha lipoproteinemia. They're in the top 10% for HDLs. They've got HDLs of 70 or 80, and we've always thought that was protective. You can get that from lifestyle, and there are some genetic abnormalities that we'll talk about that render your HDL high. So let's look at the, the relationship between high, low, and intermediate HDL and IMT. We're going to take 55 subjects with primary hypoalpha lipoproteinemia. This is predominantly genetic. They were not overweight or diabetic. 55 subjects with high HDL, and they were matched to their low HDL colleagues for age, gender, and total cholesterol. The only difference was in their HDLs. And then we have 55 controls with midline HDL. So it's kind of like the three bears, high, low, and just right. Now, the 55 subjects with low HDL, their average HDL is 31. Those with a high HDL, they're 70. Those that were right in the middle were 50. And we're going to link mean carotid IMT with HDL. Those with the low HDL had more plaque at 0.87. That makes sense. Individuals with normal healthy HDLs are 0.65. Individuals with the sky high HDLs, they were no better. So we've always felt that a high HDL is protective, but it may be that you need an adequate HDL and that a sky high HDL doesn't provide more protection than a physiologic HDL. Because some of the people with the sky high HDL, the HDL is not working normally. So we don't really need to push and shove with drugs to raise your HDL higher if it's already adequate. That's the message from this slide. Now, now we're going to look at um, 559 lipid clinic patients with all forms of lipid abnormalities. You're going to measure the mean IMT of the common, the bifurcation, the internal carotid, the external carotid, and look at the mean, and then you're going to pick the maximum of those four. And the lower the HDL, those with low HDL below, 40, below um, 42 have greater mean and maximal IMTs. Those with sky high HDLs, there's no additional pr protection. So we don't want you to have a low HDL, but we don't have to push to have a sky high HDL. We want to have an adequate HDL to carry out reverse cholesterol transport. 
Now, I'm not dissing the value of a high HDL because if we look at the, the population in general from the Framingham epidemiologic study, here we have increasing LDL from 100 to 220 and decreasing or increasing HDL from 25 to 85. The greatest risk are those with a high LDL and a low HDL. Individuals with a low LDL of 100, that would be desirable, but a low HDL are also at risk. So the LDL promotes plaque deposition, it's a bad guy. The HDL regresses plaque, it's a good guy, and there's interplay between the two. My need to lower your LDL is greater if you have a lower HDL. My need to raise your HDL is greater if you have a low, if you have a high LDL. There's a balance here that we wish to achieve. How do we raise our HDL? Exercise, fish oil, and niacin. And my favorite therapy in cardiology is to stimulate HDL function with phosphatidylcholine. This is um, technically called 1,2-dilinolenophosphatidylcholine in Europe. It's marketed under the trade name Lipostabil and N Essential. It is off patent in Europe. It will not be a commercial drug in the United States because it's off patent. Thus, you do not hear about this material on uh, TV ads during the Super Bowl. But it is the most effective therapy in cardiology, and we are allowed to bring it in from Europe and treat patients. And this is how I treat family members with cardiovascular disease. This material, given orally or intravenously, stimulates the HDL into, uh, into increase its function and the HDL will do a better job of sucking LDL cholesterol out of the plaque and taking it out of your body. And your LDL will fall, your HDL will rise, your triglycerides will fall. It also improves cell membrane function. We want a lot of unsaturated phosphatidylcholine in our cell membranes. So phosphatidylcholine, this specific unsaturated phosphatidylcholine, not only has it been proven to be a value in all cardiovascular conditions, it's a value in liver health and in brain health and basically the health of every cell in your body. Because not only are we taking unwanted or excessive cholesterol out of the body, we're improving the function of the cell membrane that surrounds every cell in your body and it has been shown to regress plaque in humans. Now, you're not going to hear about it in the United States because it's not patentable, but it is my favorite therapy to raise HDL and promote reverse cholesterol transport. Now, what you are going to hear a lot about in the near future is dalcetribid. The HDL particle is degraded by an enzyme called CETP, cholesterol esterase transferase protein, an enzyme that is inhibited by, cell, by dalcetribid. And if you take dalcetribid, this degradative enzyme's activity is decreased and your HDL will rise by 30% in a few weeks. We are involved in a clinical study of dalcetribid in individuals who recently sustained a heart attack or had an episode of unstable angina. And individuals who are six weeks out from their event who are on standard therapy including a statin to lower their LDL at the maximally tolerated dose will be randomized to placebo or dalcetribid in an effort to raise your HDL. And we feel that the addition of dalcetribid will raise your HDL, promote reverse cholesterol transport, improve blood flow, decrease plaque, etc. above and beyond standard drug therapy. And we're going to be monitoring not just your lipids, but your clinical outcome. And we hope to demonstrate that this drug is effective. This will give us a new therapeutic tool in our armamentarium, one that your insurance company will recognize and cover. Lipoprotein A. Lipoprotein A is the ugly cholesterol. If LDL is the bad, the HDL is good, Lipoprotein A is the ugly cholesterol. It is a repair particle. It does, that's its job in nature, but it does an overly zealous job of repairing plaque. It is associated with vein graft closure and restenosis after balloon angioplasty and cardiovascular disease, especially in young people. When I see a young person, that's someone less than 60 with a heart attack, almost always they have a high LPA. Now let's look at the link between LPA and IMT. 826 subjects, 
125 men and women in the 5th, 6th, and 7th decades of life residing in Bolzano province in Italy. You're going to measure their lip protein A level, we'll, we'll call that LPA. The median value was 8.8, .8. the range was, was 0.1 to 143. And you're going to do a carotid ultrasound looking for plaque or wall irregularity that was seen in 326 of the 826 subjects. You're going to repeat the ultrasound at five years. You're going to be looking for early disease, that is new plaque in a previously normal area, or advancing disease, plaque progression to a 40% narrowing um, in an area that previously had plaque. Those with early disease, the lip protein A levels were greater at 9.1 than those who did not. Those that had advanced disease that were progressing their plaque had greater LPA levels than those who did not. So a high LPA is associated with uh, the in initiation of cardiovascular disease and particularly its progression. Early atherosclerosis occurred in 15%. The LPA was predictive when the LDL was also high. Your relative risk for new plaque in individuals that had an LDL of 127 or above, if your LPA was above 40, the 90th, per, the, the 90th percentile was about 30, the 95th is 45. Above 40, you're 3.7 times as likely to have plaque. LPA by itself is not nearly as deleterious as LPA in the presence of other risk factors. LPA's job in health is to be a repair particle. And what happens if you damage your artery with other risk factors, LPA goes in and tries to repair it and does an overzealous job because again, Mother Nature did not design us to be good cardiovascular patients. LPA's job is to close up an artery that is cracked or damaged due to vitamin C deficiency. If we have a dysfunctional artery with plaque and irregularity, LPA goes in and overzealously repairs it. So the risk of LPA is greater in, in, if you have a high LDL. In advanced disease occurred in 28%, LPA was predictive irrespective of the LDL level. Those with LPA levels of above 40 were six times as likely to develop new plaque as those who were um, 10 or below. Because these people already have damaged arteries, there's something there for the LPA to overzealously repair. So LPA is a bad guy, particularly in association with other risk factors. Let's go back now to the Quopio ischemic heart disease study. This is Dr. Salonen's group in Finland. We'll look at just under 1,300 asymptomatic um, Eastern Finnish men. You're going to do an ultrasound exam of the right and left common carotid artery, bifurcation of the bulb, normal, I am, abnormal was IMT above one, non-stenotic plaque, and a large plaque was a 20 percenter. 46 percent of the men had normal ultrasounds their three-year heart attack risk was 2%. 21% had an increased IMT, their three-year risk was 3%. That makes sense. 30% had small plaques that would not be picked up on a standard ultrasound, their risk was 4%. 3% had large plaques, their risk was 12%, as you'd expect. But again, as, as in our, our initial, in the study presented in the initial section, individuals with an increased IMT and small plaque would not be picked up on an angiogram or a standard ultrasound, but they would be picked up by IMT assessment and you can show increased risk. So relative risk versus normal, if there's any abnormality on the IMT assessment, you're three times as likely to have an event as if it's normal. If your IMT is thickened, you're 2.1 times as likely to have an event. And if there's visible plaque, you're four times as likely. For every 0.1 millimeter incremental increase in IMT versus your colleagues, your risk of a heart attack increases by 11%. So we don't like to see a high IMT, and we don't like to see a high, high rate of IMT progression. So Dr. Salonen in this portion of the study asked, what factors predict IMT progression? 146 of the subjects had a repeat scan two years later. We're going to correlate their IMT progression with risk factors. And the regression coefficient, the greater the regression coefficient, the more powerful is the relationship, the lower the p-value, the more statistically significant. Age was important, and we know that the older you are, the more rapidly will your IMT progress. Same with LDL cholesterol, same with smoking. Platelet aggregation. 
If your plates are sticky, that reflects low nitric oxide, low endothelial function. So it makes sense that sticky plates are associated with an increased rate of IMT progression. Having copper above the midline, above the 50th percentile, increased your risk just as much as did age, smoking, and cholesterol. Having a selenium level below midline was protective. So high copper, not sky high, but above the 50th percentile, selenium below the 50th percentile were just as potent predictors of disease progression as were the common risk factors that we would all appreciate, such as LDL cholesterol or smoking. Why would the levels of copper and selenium play a role in disease progression? Here's your, your relative increase in two-year IMT progression. If your copper is above midline, you're 2.1 times as likely to progress. Same risk as if you're a smoker. If your selenium is below midline, you're 80% more likely to progress. That was a more powerful predictor than LDL cholesterol. If we look at two-year progression, age and smoking adjusted, individuals with a high LDL and a high copper progressed 260 points, 0.26 millimeters. Those with a high LDL and low copper did not progress as much. What's the interaction here? It's not the LDL cholesterol that layers out plaque. It's the oxidized cholesterol. Copper is an oxidant. It makes sense that there might be a synergy. If we are looking at the risk of a future event versus middle and upper tercile of the standard risk factors, yes, if your LDL is high, your risk increases. But if your LDL is oxidized and it's high, your risk increases synergistically because LDL cholesterol doesn't hurt us until it is oxidized. Copper is an oxidant and it's as powerful an oxidant as is cigarette smoking. Now, here we look at two-year progression, age and smoking adjusted. If your LDL is high and your copper is high, you're going to progress much more rapidly than if your LDL is high and your copper is low. Looking at it this way, if you have high copper, it's not a problem unless your LDL is high. Copper alone is not a problem. LDL alone is not a problem. High copper, high LDL, it's oxidized. You have a big problem. Now let's look at the interaction between selenium, an antioxidant mineral, and copper, an oxidant, and LDL, which is susceptible to oxidation. 126 men in the Quopio study. At baseline, you're going to look at standard risk factors, their mean common carotid IMT, copper and selenium levels, repeat the IMT at two years, correlate progression of IMT with copper, selenium, and LDL, corrected or adjusted for other risk factors. Now here, in the high, here's high copper, here's low copper. If you have high copper and your LDL is high and your selenium is low, your goose is cooked. You're progressing real fast. But if you have a high LDL and a high copper, so you're going to oxidize the LDL, but you're also high in selenium, which is an antioxidant, you're going to progress more rapidly than individuals with lower cholesterol, but there's going to be great protection. Individuals with low selenium, high copper and high LDL, they're in big trouble. But individuals with high selenium, and this is just selenium above the 50th percentile, you're not at the same risk with high LDL and high copper. It's all balance. Copper is an oxidant, selenium is an antioxidant. They're vying to see who's going to control the LDL. If the oxidants win, your LDL is oxidized, you're going to get endothelial dysfunction, increased IMT, and increased event risk. Let's look at mercury. The fins have the highest rate of diabetes, degenerative disease, and cardiovascular disease in the world, and that's because Finland is the most mercury toxic region of the world because their inland waters have been uh, polluted with mercury. Just over a thousand, at this point, healthy middle-aged Finnish men, you're going to look at their standard risk factors, their common carotid mean IMT, and hair mercury levels, which reflects methylmercury from fish. 
You're going to repeat the carotid IMT at four years, correlate the four-year IMT progression rate with hair mercury standard risk factors. Now, the mean hair mercury level was 1.8 with a range between none and 23. Four-year IMT progression was 110 points. The maximum progression was huge, 1.3 millimeters, and some actually regressed. We're going to divide the subjects into quintiles of hair mercury, the highest amount of mercury, the lowest amount. For each one microgram per gram hair weight increase in mercury, disease progressed at eight points. So the more mercury you had in your body, in your hair mercury, the more rapidly did your IMT progress. If we look at the correlation coefficients, which assesses the the potency of a parameter to cause increased IMT progression. Systolic blood pressure was the most important, followed by hair mercury, followed by if you were taking cholesterol drugs, dietary iron, because iron's an oxidant, smoking, and age. Four-year IMT progression versus hair mercury, those in the highest quintile progressed much more rapidly than those with a lower mercury burden, because like copper, mercury is a powerful oxidant. From another study, if you're looking at factors that predict oxidation of your LDL, which is what you really don't want, the most important was hair mercury, which reflects fish mercury. Number two was urine mercury, which reflects amalgam mercury, nicotine, copper, ferritin, which is iron, all oxidants. The only thing that was protective was your vitamin C intake, because vitamin C, like selenium, is an antioxidant. Arsenic. There's a lot of arsenic in the groundwater in various areas in the United States and in overseas, uh, Taiwan and Bangladesh have a lot of arsenic in the artesian wells from which they draw their drinking water. We're going to look at 463 adults residing in southeast Taiwan. You're going to measure their standard risk factors, arsenic exposure, various parameters of arsenic exposure. You're going to do an ultrasound and look at their mean maximal IMT and various measures of plaque score, and you're going to correlate the IMT findings with standard risk factors and the amount of arsenic they've been exposed to. IMT increases with age in men and women. That's not a surprise. And if you look at various measures, assessments of arsenic exposure, the greater the cumulative arsenic exposure, the greater was their IMT. Like mercury, like copper, arsenic is an oxidant. Let's look at some younger individuals, 35-year-olds, healthy young adults living in Bangladesh. You're going to measure arsenic exposure. You're going to do the carotid IMT. And to find an IMT above 0.75 is abnormal for that population. You're going to correlate the IMT findings with standard risk factors and parameters of arsenic exposure. Well water arsenic, urine arsenic concentration, cumulative arsenic exposure, was greater in those with a high IMT versus those with a low IMT. Arsenic is an oxidant. It's a problem, just as is copper and mercury. Cadmium is another toxic heavy metal that we get from tobacco. Um, individuals with high blood pressure tend to have higher cadmium levels than those with normal blood pressure. Of interest, Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri both draw their water from the same river but in one of the cities, they soften it, and something went wrong, and they put cadmium in it. And in the Kansas City that has the cadmium in their water, they have much more hypertension and cardiovascular disease than in the opposite city that does not have the cadmium in their water. And I guess you have to say that in, in Kansas City, they've gone about as far as they can go to make business for us cardiologists. Cardiomyopathy, pump dysfunction for no apparent reason, is often due to heavy metals. And if you look at cadmium levels in non-smokers with cardiomyopathy, they have much higher levels than the normal people. And smoking increases your cadmium concentration, but in smokers and non-smokers, those with cardiomyopathy had higher levels of cadmium. Um, we grow our tobacco in Virginia, North Carolina, because the soil cadmium content in those regions is greater, and the tobacco plant loves cadmium. So when you smoke a cigarette, you're inhaling cadmium that stays in your body essentially forever. Here we're going to look at 100 consecutive individuals who died in hospitals in North Carolina. They had an autopsy, 
X are people who died of cardiovascular disease. The circles are people who died of non-cardiovascular disease. You can see the product of increasing lead, increasing cadmium, these people died of cardiovascular disease. Individuals with low lead, none of them died of cardiovascular disease except those with high cadmium. Cadmium and lead, oxidized cholesterol, endothelial dysfunction, increased IMT, cardiovascular disease. EDK chelation therapy involves the administration of a, a synthetic amino acid, magnesium EDTA, into your veins, and the EDTA grabs lead and cadmium and arsenic and takes it out through the kidney. And in this study, they looked at 18 patients and looked at the ejection fraction, the percentage of blood the heart ejects with each beat. And it improved following chelation. Why? Because metals poison every enzyme in your body. They poison the enzymes that generate energy. Without energy, your heart doesn't pump so well. You take out the poisons, the enzymes come back online, your ejection fraction rises. If you do an endomyocardial biopsy, that is a heart muscle biopsy of people with cardiomyopathy, I became quite proficient in endomyocardial biopsy when I trained because we were doing heart transplants. And you would monitor for transplant rejection by doing a biopsy. And what you do, you put a catheter into the jugular vein in the neck and you drop down a catheter and it has on the tip of it sort of like a fingernail clipper, only it's a little bit smaller and we would take a bite out of the heart and pull and the patient would feel this tug and they'd have these extra beats but then they usually did okay and we could look at the heart muscle biopsy. Now these days I'm giving you vitamins and not doing heart muscle biopsies and I think you do appreciate that. But in a study done in Italy of individuals with dilated cardiomyopathy, their hearts were punk, they were failing, not due to blocked arteries, it's called idiopathic, it means we don't know why. They had 22,000 times as much mercury in their heart cells as did normal people. They had 12,000 times as much antimony, 250 times as much arsenic. The greater the metal, the toxic metal concentration, the lower was their ejection fraction, the more complicated were their arrhythmias. Heavy metals cause heart muscle damage. They damage every cell in the body. Now, I don't think these people were exposed to 22,000 times as much mercury as were normal people. Our current feeling is that individuals with cardiomyopathy People who are toxic in general, they were exposed to toxins, but they either have an acquired or a genetic abnormality in their detox system, so they become sponge for heavy metals. Right now, we're doing our methyl cycle testing. We're finding that individuals with genetic methyl cycle abnormalities, enzymes too fast or too slow, their detox pathways are blocked. That's why they are sponges for heavy metals. So while we're going to detox you, we're also looking at your genetics and changing your diet and your supplement program to rectify the genetic abnormality to make you into an auto detoxifier. Now, what is, how can we accelerate the detoxification of heavy metals? We can use a static magnetic field. My procedure is MME Magnetic Molecular Energizer. This is a 10,000 pound electromagnet. We will uh, treat your heart or any other dysfunctional body region with a very powerful static magnetic field that causes your electrons to revolve around the nucleus more rapidly. We basically speed up all useful biochemical reactions in the heart or the body region we're treating. We increase endogenous stem cell activity. We make energy and that energy can be used in detoxification. And when I have patients with advanced cardiomyopathy, I will treat them with MME with the metal binding agent and we can show that pump function improves and we can decrease the size of the heart and decrease the degree of valvular regurgitation. We're adding energy to the heart. That energy is used to make the heart cells function better and to detoxify the heart. And in people with cardiomyopathy, their problem we believe is toxicity and or infection due to a genetic problem we can drive the toxins out, support the heart, and we can fairly rapidly improve heart pumping function. Lead is a huge problem. Um, your, we've been expo the, the lead exposure today is less than it was 20 years ago because we took it out of, um, uh, of uh, gasoline, so it's no longer in the exhaust. And the lead solder in tin cans has been removed. So our blood lead levels are lower now than they were 20 years ago, but our body burden is greater. If you look at bone lead, you know, 85 to 90% of the lead in your body is stashed in bone. 
your, your body doesn't want it to poison you, so it stashes it in bone. And it's pretty much a one-way route. Mother Nature did not design us to be good at lead detoxification. So it enters our body, it enters our blood, it goes into bone. And it, our bone lead levels, our body lead levels, our body levels of all toxin metals increases with age because we don't know how to get rid of them. And as our bone lead level rises, our bodies decline physiologically. If we look at serum creatinine, which is a marker of kidney dysfunction, a high creatinine reflects a lower GFR and decreased kidney function. As your blood lead level rises, your kidney function declines. There is some equilibrium between bone lead and blood lead, but it's not very tight. But the higher your bone lead, the higher your blood lead, the worse your kidney function. That makes sense. The relative risk of high blood pressure versus lead quartile in premenopausal women. The normal lead is below 10. That's 98% of us. In this study, women in the fourth quartile, their lead level was about four or five, well within normal limits, were 3.4 times as likely to have high blood pressure as women with lower lead levels. Postmenopausal women, the relationship's even greater. Why is the relationship between blood lead and hypertension greater in post as opposed to premenopausal women. Well, with menopause, you lose the hormonal support for bone mass. As your bone mass decreases, all that lead and cadmium that your body socked away in your bone rushes out into your bloodstream. This is why we see this acceleration of hypertension and hyperlipidemia following menopause. It's not just the loss of hormonal support. It's all this old trash that your body wisely tucked away in bone coming out into your circulation to make you sick. Lead in cardiovascular disease. Here we're going to look at 14153 adults participating in the National Health and Education Nutritional Study. These are individuals who were canvassed between 88 and 94. At baseline, you're going to look at standard risk factors, smoking, diabetes, hypertension, etc., and blood lead levels. You're going to exclude from analysis the top 1 to 2% that had quote unquote abnormal blood lead levels of 10. If you go to your doctor and ask for blood lead level, if it's below 10, the lab says normal, don't need to worry about it, but, or should we? You're going to take these people with normal, you don't really need to worry about it, lead levels, and stratify them into terciles. The median lead level was 2.6. The first tercile is 0 to 1.9. The middle is 1.9 to 3.6. The upper tercile, the upper third of normal Americans, was about 3.6. Now that's well below the upper lived the, the cutoff of 10, but let's record mortality and cause of mortality over the following three, 12 years. Relate your risk to your lead tercile still well within the normal range. If we look at all cause mortality, individuals in the upper tercile above 3.6 were 30% more likely to die over 12 years as those with lower lead levels. Cardiovascular mortality rose 10% in the middle tercile and 60% in the upper tercile of lead within the normal range. If we look at heart attack mortality, it rises by 10% in the middle tercile. It doubles in the third tercile. Stroke mortality more than doubles in the middle tercile, 2.6 times the risk in the upper tercile. So a blood lead level in the normal range is incredibly dangerous. Lead is a toxin at any level in our kids. The upper limit of normal is 10, but if your kid has a lead level of 9, their IQ is going to be 8 points lower than a kid with a lead level of 0 to 1. Lead, cadmium, mercury, arsenic at any level is quite dangerous. They're oxidants. They oxidize our LDL, cause endothelial dysfunction, soft plaque deposition, cardiovascular events, they poison enzymes. Why is this occurring? Our body generates free radicals that want to oxidize LDL and other particles, and then we have antioxidant defense systems to neutralize it. The problem here is that cadmium lead, arsenic, mercury, iron and copper promote oxidation. They are oxidants. So the higher levels you have of these toxic metals, and iron beyond what you need, and copper beyond what you need is toxic, you'll get more free radical stress, more oxidation, more cardiovascular disease. EDJ chelation, me giving you a synthetic amino acid that will bind to and remove from your body lead and cadmium will improve kidney function. 
And this makes sense because lead and cadmium are toxic to the vasculature, they're toxic to the kidney. In um, a study of individuals with chronic kidney disease, their GFRs were around 40. Now, ideal is 100, abnormal is 60. These people have chronic kidney disease. You're going to follow them for two years. Their kidney function is failing. They're on their way to dialysis. And at this point, you look at their blood lead levels, 6.1, well within the normal range. But the blood lead level is not a really good measure of your body burden. To measure body burden, we do a provocative challenge. We will give you intravenous EDTA that will enter your body and scarf up lead and take it out in the urine. So these people had a body lead burden of 151 units. They receive a series of IV EDTA chelation treatments. They lower their, their blood lead from 6 to 4, not a whole lot, but their body burden falls a lot more. In the control group, they continue to spiral downhill on their way to dialysis. The chelation group, they stabilized. So simple chelation therapy that costs one to $2,000 will stabilize these people with chronic kidney disease and spare them dialysis. And this has been, been published in two studies in the New England Journal of Medicine and the Archives of Internal Medicine for all the world to see, but sadly, American physicians ignore this fact and your insurance companies will not cover the cost of chelation therapy even though it's been proven to spare kidney function and help keep people off dialysis. I'm involved, our practice is involved in a study sponsored by the National Institute of Health called TACT, Trial to Assess Chelation Therapy. We're going to get 2,372 subjects that are 50 years of age, non-smokers with intact kidney function who have had a prior heart attack. And they're all going to receive standard post-heart attack drug therapy, and they're going to get 30 IV treatments over 30 weeks, and then one treatment a month for 10 months and a multivitamin. Half of the subjects are going to get IV chelation, half get IV placebo. Half get a strong multi, half get a weak multi. So we'll be looking at IV DHA with or without a multi versus placebo with or without a multi on outcome. And it's a randomized double-blind study. Neither I nor my subjects nor our nursing staff know who's getting the real thing, who's getting a fake. It's made up off-site and shipped to us with a code. And the idea was to get 100 doctors involved, 50 experienced chelating physicians, 50 previously non-chelating cardiologists, and they wound up with one guy who's good in the cath lab and who has a great deal of experience with chelation therapy. And we're going to be looking at primary and secondary endpoints and safety profile, and we hope to show that Metal detoxification, particularly with the multivitamin, improves outcome in individuals with cardiovascular disease. Another means of promoting detoxification is with a static magnetic field. We talked about how our MME machine works. We can also use a magnetic mattress pad to impart to you a, a steady, negatively oriented magnetic field, and that will also help you detoxify while you sleep. And we've proven this. We took seven subjects measured their overnight urine toxic metal excretion with them sleeping on their usual mattress, their usual mattress plus the negative field sleep pad, and then the negative field sleep pad with DMSA, which is a biological chelating agent. And what we found, with, with these negative field only sleep pads, you are exposed in a cloud of negatively oriented magnetism, and that will cause your electrons to accelerate and that will speed up your biochemistry. And if we look at mercury on your regular mattress, on the magnetic pad it increases, and when we add a chelator we get even more. So we have patients sleeping on a negative field only mattress pad and taking a chelator, and that way they can detoxify during sleep. We are in the midst of a pilot study. We're going to take 13 of my own patients with known stable angina and coronary disease. At baseline we're going to look at your symptoms, we're going to have you carry out the Seattle Angina Questionnaire score. We're going to measure your mean and mean maximal IMT. We're going to do a carotid ultrasound to quantify lesion severity. We're going to do a provocative challenge, see how much metal you spill in the urine, look at your standard risk factors, then we're going to treat you for six months. And two groups will get the magnetic mattress pad. One group will not get the magnetic mattress pad. They'll receive DMSA, a, a biochemical metal chelator, 
Some will receive lipophosphorate, which is the unsaturated phosphatidylcholine. Some will receive unsaturated phosphatidylcholine with EDTA. So we're going to look at the effect of a magnetic field with or without different types of metal detoxification, with or without reverse cholesterol transport on outcome. We also hope, funding permitted, to do a formal Institutional Review Board monitored randomized double-blind study of MME in patients with congestive heart failure. It's been my observation that patients with congestive heart failure, especially those with cardiomyopathy, improve with MME. And the case studies are available on the heartfixer.com website. But our plan is to take 60 patients with heart failure, half due to coronary disease, half not due to coronary disease. We're going to measure your, your symptoms at baseline. There's the Minnesota Living with Heart Failure score, which is an objective measure. We're going to measure your ejection fraction, and then you're going to get 200 hours of MME. Half of you will get fake, half of you will get real. Some will, some will not receive the metal binding agent DMSA. We're going to reevaluate you at six months, break the code. Those of you that got fake therapy will then get real therapy. So everyone's going to get real MME, but half will be placebo, half will be real at first, so we can look at the effect, and we hope to begin this study um, this fall. Now, this is the slide again with all the factors associated with an increased IMT and an increased rate of IMT progression. And we've presented papers covering all of these individual causes of endothelial dysfunction, IMT, cardiovascular disease. And now we're gonna switch gears and talk about therapies that have been shown to prevent or delay progression of IMT. So we're gonna move on to the next section, stabilizing IMT initially with pharmacologic approaches. So far we've been talking about factors that cause an increased IMT and an increased rate of IMT progression. Now let's discuss approaches to stabilizing or regressing the IMD, IMT. In this section, we'll focus on pharmacologic approaches. Let's talk about cholesterol reduction. We're going to look at 78 hyperlipidemic subjects participating in the CLASS, or Cholesterol Lowering Atherosclerosis Study. These men had all undergone prior open heart surgery, so they have known coronary disease. Their mean baseline cholesterol was 245. At the beginning of the CLASS study, you're going to look at their lipid levels, the mean common carotid IMT, and you're going to do a coronary angiogram and a carotid angiogram. All the men will be placed on a lipid reduction diet, less than 125 milligrams a day of cholesterol, less than 22 percent of their calories is fat. So they're all going on a healthy diet, and you randomize the men to receive cholestopol, which is a bile acid binding agent. It wastes bile acids. Your body has to make more bile acids from cholesterol. And niacin, which blocks the generation of LDL cholesterol. So half the men received dual lipid lowering therapy with cholesterol and niacin. Half received diet alone. You're going to reevaluate it two and four years. And what you find with diet alone, not much happens with cholesterol, LDL, that's blue to red, HDL or triglycerides. They fell a little bit. But with dual drug lowering therapy, cholesterol falls from 270 to 185, LDL from 174 to 100. That's a big drop in LDL. HDL went up, triglycerides fell. So with drug therapy over diet, your lipid panel is going to improve. What happens to your IMT? Well, in the control group, with diet alone, their cholesterol did not fall. Their IMT increased from 0.61 at baseline to 0.65 at two years and 0.66 at four years. That was a 0.05 millimeter or 50 point increase. It was an 8% increase. In those whose cholesterols fell, their LDL fell from 175 to 100, they regressed by 8% their IMT regressed. The yearly change in the placebo group was 12.5 points a year. The yearly change in the drug group was negative 12.5 points. So they regressed. And as we're going to show you later on, if your IMT regresses in response to therapy, that is associated with a 
protection against adverse events. Here we're going to look at the MARS study, lovastatin therapy and IMT progression, the monitored atherosclerosis regression study. We're going to look at 188 subjects, all with at least one artery with a 50% narrowing, all with established coronary disease. Their cholesterol is between 190 and 295. 90% were men, middle age, 16% were smokers. At baseline, we're going to look at your lipids and the mean IMT of the, of the common carotid artery as we would measure in the office. All go on a low cholesterol, low saturated fat diet, randomized to placebo or lovastat, which is a, a statin drug which blocks the generation of LDL cholesterol in the liver. You're going to reevaluate these men periodically over the following four years of diet or diet plus lovastatin. Diet alone doesn't do much for your lipids as, as we understand. With lovastatin, the cholesterol fell from 230 to 155. The LDL plummeted from 156 to 85. Now, in the placebo group, the IMT progressed, as you would expect. In the lovastatin group, it regressed dramatically from 0.73 down to 0.62. Dramatic regression with lipid reduction. In the placebo group, there was a 7% rise in IMT over four years of 46 points. In the lovastatin group, 12% fall. So it was a 15 point per year rise with placebo. It was a 28 point per year regression with lovastatin. Fantastic disease regression. If we look at the change in IMT as a function of the baseline IMT, in blue are individuals whose baseline IMT was below average, below 0.72. Red were those who were above. With placebo therapy, both groups progressed. With lovastatin therapy, both groups regressed. But the higher your IMT was to begin with, the greater was your regression. Those who needed the regression got the most. Similar situation in smokers. Smokers had greater regression with lovastatin than did non-smokers. So the sicker you are, the greater your plaque burden. And if you're a smoker, which promotes progression of plaque, the greater will be your relative benefit from lipid lowering therapy, which makes sense. Women did poorly with placebo therapy. So women progressed more rapidly. Men and women both improved with lovastatin therapy. If we compare lovastatin with cholestopol niacin, both treatment schemes were effective. Lovastatin had a more powerful degree of regression. Now these were different studies, different populations, but we feel that the statin agents are our most powerful lipid lowering agents and they're associated with greater protection against progression of cardiovascular disease, greater protection against progression of IMT, and better outcomes because the statins, not only do they lower your cholesterol, they have an antioxidant effect. They block the generation of free radicals and they improve endothelial function. So they lower cholesterol, which is good, but they also provide an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory effect, which is why statins are the preferred drug to lower cholesterol in individuals with cardiovascular disease and individuals who do not wish to have cardiovascular disease. Well, statin therapy works, and we all understand this. What else might work if added on to statin therapy? We're going to look at the ELVA study here the effect of long-term metoprolol, a beta blocker, an anti-adrenaline, on atherosclerosis. We're going to look at 92 hyperlipidemic Swiss subjects with early atherosclerosis, all with an uh, IMT mean above a millimeter at the bifurcation. They had a high cholesterol, LDL above um, 193, and 80% had measurable plaque, a focal 50% increase in IMT. They didn't have known advanced disease, but they're well on their way. And this is a group who could certainly benefit from risk factor reduction. So you're going to stop all their cholesterol lowering drugs for three weeks, do the baseline evaluation, look at lipids off drug therapy, look at the mean IMT of the common carotid artery in the bifurcation, begin all on lipid therapy and most receive statins. And then on top of statin therapy, you're going to randomize them to metoprolol, 100 milligrams a day or placebo. 
metoprolol blocks the beta receptor, blocks the adrenaline receptor. We talked about how if you stand up quickly, you make adrenaline, and that's a vasoconstrictor, and that might be associated with an increased rate of disease progression. Metoprolol would block that biochemical phenomenon. We use metoprolol frequently to control angina because it'll lower your heart rate and blood pressure. So we, it won't open up the artery, but it'll decrease the body's demand for blood and oxygen and attenuate your angina. Here we're looking to see if metoprolol will attenuate the rate of IMT progression when added to um, a statin therapy. So you're going to do the baseline, you're going to repeat the labs in the IMT at one, two, and three years, double blind protocol followed, no one knew who was getting the beta blocker, who was getting the placebo. Now, heart rate fell and blood pressure fell with metoprolol, it did not fall with placebo, that would make sense. We use metoprolol to treat rapid heart rate and high blood pressure. Cholesterol fell the same in both groups. The metoprolol had no additional effect above and beyond statin therapy at lipid reduction, nor would we expect it to. But if we look at IMT, blue is lipid reduction drug therapy, statin therapy alone. Red is statins plus a beta blocker. You can see that at one, two, and three years, the common carotid mean IMT progressed despite statin therapy. But because statin therapy doesn't cover everything, it's not a cure-all for all atherosclerotic phenomenon. But statin therapy plus beta blocker, there was a regression. Change in common carotid IMT, it did progress. It, it progressed basically 10 points per year, or 20 points over two years, 40 points over um, uh, three years with statin therapy, and it regressed and stayed regressed with statin and beta blocker therapy. If we look at the bifurcation, there was regression, significant regression, with lipid reduction, statins, and metoprolol. Change in the bifurcation, there was some progression with statin therapy alone. There was regression that held to, to, to a greater degree with statin therapy plus metoprolol. Another study was done with a lower dose of metoprolol, the same effects. So we used to think of beta blockers as simply therapeutic to decrease your symptoms if you have cardiovascular disease. Now we're understanding that they actually have some protective effects. They block the deleterious effects of adrenaline. They preserve the endothelium and lower the rate of IMT progression, at least in this study when it was added on to statin therapy. Now let's look at niacin therapy. We think of statins primarily to lower LDL and niacin to raise the HDL. Would there be a synergism between statins to lower the LDL, niacin to raise the HDL? The Arbiter 2 study was done at Walter Reed, 167 hyperlipidemic um, male subjects with known coronary disease. 90% male, mean age 65, prior heart attack in 50%, angioplasty or stent in 46%, bypass in 46%, a sick group of vets primarily, all on statin therapy. And with statin therapy, their LDL was below 130, but their HDL was not high, it was below target. And half had insulin resistance, either type 2 diabetes or the metabolic syndrome, which we'll talk about in a moment. At baseline, you look at their lipids, the common carotid artery, mean IMT, the study protocol, statin therapies continued, antioxidants are put on hold, randomized to receive niospan, a long-acting niacin that you take at bedtime, 500 milligrams at, 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 at the beginning of the study, and then it's tolerated to go to 1,000, or placebo. So it's statin and niospan, statin and placebo, reevaluated at one year, double blind protocols followed. Now, the addition of niospan did not lower the LDL further, but it did make the HDL go up, which was the idea. Now, one downside of niacin is it tends to compromise insulin sensitivity. In the statin therapy alone group, the fasting sugar rose from 106 to 115 because this was an an elderly, sicker group of patients that were, had some tendency to diabetes, but the group that received statin and niospan, their blood sugar rose a little bit more. That is one downside of niacin and niospan. It may aggravate type 2 diabetes or insulin insensitivity. However, it had a beneficial effect on IMT progression. Statin and placebo increased 5% or 44 points 
from 0.868 to 0.912. Statin and niospan progressed only 2% or 14 points. So adding on niospan to raise HDL added to the lipid lowering beneficial effect, the beneficial effect on IMT progression that you would get from statin therapy alone. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, some of the vets were insulin insensitive. They had diabetes or the metabolic syndrome, and they did not get the same benefit from niospan. They did benefit, but the vets that did not have any insulin insensitivity got the greatest benefit. Side effects of niacin is flushing, which is a nuisance, but some people cannot tolerate it. So there's an increased nuisance side effect of flushing, but there is improved um, protection against progression of IMT, and of course, event rate was 10% with statin alone, 4% with statin and niospan. I would prefer my patient to have a 4% event rate versus a 10% event rate, so when I'm using drug therapy to lower their cholesterol, I like to combine a statin and niospan for the added protection. Arbiter 3 extended the program over three years. 140 patients who had completed Arbiter 2, statin and niospan versus statin and placebo. 57 had been on statin and niospan, they continued. 47 had been on statin alone, and then they cross over to get statin and niospan at the two-year point. Now, statin alone, they were progressing, and then you add in the niospan and they regress. Statin and niospan, they didn't regress as much as statin and placebo, and then they regress a lot more. In all the groups, their HDL rose, and as the HDL rose, the IMT regressed. So the point here, it's never too late to change therapies. Just because we have you on statin versus statin and niospan, we can learn uh, from research and add these therapies in. And those individuals, even though their, their niospan was added at the two-year point, they still received a benefit. The concern we have with niacin is type 2 diabetes, insulin insensitivity. Diabetes used to be considered a contraindication. You were not supposed to use niacin. Let's look at the effect of niacin on lipids and IMT in individuals with known insulin insensitivity. These are 50, 21 to 45 year old subjects with a metabolic syndrome. The metabolic syndrome is a pre-diabetic or insulin insensitive state. Individuals have central obesity, elevated fasting sugar, high blood pressure, inflammation, their CRPs are high, elevated triglycerides, low HDL. Now, niacin in theory would be a value here because it raises HDL, lowers triglycerides, lowers inflammation, but the downside is it may worsen insulin insensitivity. So let's see how well it works. We're gonna look at risk factors, the mean common carotid IMT, brachial artery, flow media vasodilatation, endothelial function, Treat them with slow niacin, which is another nighttime niacin preparation, 1,000 milligrams every evening or placebo, reevaluate it one year. And what you find in the niacin group, HDL rises by 24%, nothing happens with placebo. LDL falls by 17%, nothing happens with placebo. Triglycerides falls. Blood sugar did not rise. C-reactive protein, a marker of inflammation, falls 20%. Brachial artery flow media vasodilatation improves by 22% from 4.6 to 5.5. Now that's not normal, but it's going in the right direction. So there were beneficial effects on lipids, inflammation, and endothelial function. And what happened to the common carotid IMT? In the placebo group, they progressed by 1%. In the slow niacin group, they regressed by nearly 1%. If they divided the, the subjects into progressors or regressors, in the placebo group, 85% progressed, only 15% improved on their own. With the niacin group, two-thirds improved, only one-third worsened. So even if you have insulin insensitivity, the net benefits of niacin outweigh the, the downsides. Probucol is a very interested lipid-lowering drug. Its trade name was Lorelco. It was available when I was a young cardiologist. It would lower the LDL. It would improve outcome. It would blunt restenosis after balloon angioplasty, but it also lowered the HDL. 
So we stopped using it because we learned that HDL was protective. Now, it still improved outcome, but it lowered HDL. Is this a good drug or a bad drug? It's still used overseas. This study was done in Japan, 246 hyperlipidemic Japanese subjects aged 30 through 89, none with unstable cardiovascular disease, some did have cardiovascular disease, 60% were recent or former smokers, 45% had high blood pressure, 22% were diabetic. You're going to look at lipids and the mean common carotid IMT. And they had a fairly high IMT of 1.3 because they were predominantly older and they were sicker. You're going to randomize them to pravastatin, which is a statin, probicol, which um, will lower the LDL and the HDL, or placebo. You repeat the baseline studies at two years. And what you find in individuals who are less than 75 years of age, cholesterol falls 21% with pravastatin, 24% with propicol. LDL falls about the same. Placebo doesn't do anything. HDL does fall by 21%. That is the, the technical downside of probucol, the HDL falls. In individuals who are above 75 years of age, Pravacol and Probucol were equally effective at lowering cholesterol and LDL, but then again, the Probucol lowers the HDL. Now, this may or may not be a problem because if your HDL is really high to begin with, it doesn't really provide you additional protection. So lowering an HDL from a super physiologic to a physiologic range may not be the problem that we once thought it was. Let's look at the effect on outcome. In those who are less than 75 years of age, IMT progressed by 20% at two years with placebo therapy. There was 16% regression with pravastatin, 18% with propicol. In those who were above 75 years, the seniors, there was 42% uh, two-year progression. Pravastatin is only 5%, and they actually regressed with propicol. So the seniors did better with propicol than they did with pravastatin. With respect to lipid reduction, the, the younger individuals, those less than 65, pravastatin and probucol were equally effective at LDL reduction and at regressing the IMT. If we look at event rate, subjects less than 75 years of age, um, black is placebo, they had many more cardiovascular events than red pravastatin and blue probucol. In the seniors, those over 75 years of age, the placebo patients had a lot of events the pravastatin patients had fewer events, but the best outcome was with probucol. So this drug that's no longer available in the United States, because it lowers HDL, which really wasn't a problem because it was lowering too high HDLs down to the midline, is associated with dramatic reductions in LDL, dramatic protection against IMT progression, and it was superior to statin therapy at lowering outcome in, in seniors. We want to control your type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes causes endothelial dysfunction, increased IMT, future uh, adverse events. So we want to lower your blood sugar, but we talked about how if we lower your blood pressure, the benefit with respect to IMT had to do with the type of drug we used. The tissue-specific ACE inhibitors work better than the angiotensin receptor blockers. May we have the same situation with sugar control. 159 patients attending a type 2 diabetes clinic in Osaka um, already on glimenclamide, which is gliburide. The trade name here is Amaryl. It's a sulfonylurea. Sulfonylureas kick more insulin out of the pancreas. But the problem is not insulin deficiency, it's insulin insensitivity. So this is sort of an irrational drug because the problem is the insulin's not um, your cells are not responding to insulin, so all these drugs do is kick out more of the insulin that's not working well. Another group was taking glycolyzide, which is a sulfonylurea that also is an antioxidant, and it's not available in the United States. A third group took glomenclamide and metformin, which is my favorite sugar-lowering agent. Metformin improves insulin sensitivity at the level of the liver. So the liver gets the word more accurately from insulin, and that's the way to lower the blood sugar. Your problem is insulin insensitivity. Metformin actually addresses the problem. So you're going to measure standard lab data, and their mean maximal and absolute maximal common carotid, internal carotid IMT. Repeat the labs periodically. Repeat the IMT at three years. And what you find 
This is the gliburide group. This is the glycoside, which is the antioxidant sulfonylurea group. And the gliburide plus metformin group, the hemoglobin A1C fell more with metformin. The HDL, the, the other labs didn't really change a whole lot. So there's fairly similar sugar control. The metformin group had a slight advantage. But again, it's not sugar control that we seek. It's protection against plaque and event rate. You can see that the mean maximal and the absolute maximal IMT progressed more with the gliburide group than they did with the antioxidant group or with the gliburide plus metformin. So the antioxidant agent, which is not available in the United States, was quite favorable. And adding metformin and insulin sensitized over the liver to standard gliburide therapy was associated with far less progression of IMT. So that's a better way to lower your sugar. IMT progression here's for gliburide, glycoside, glib gliburide, and metformin, mean maximal, maximal. The metformin group was more effective. And they showed that the IMT progressed more in individuals with low HDL and um, greater hemoglobin A1Cs, but there was a lot of scatter. And that's so it wasn't just the sugar reduction, it's how you lower the sugar. Same situation that we demonstrated previously with blood pressure control. Drugs that have beneficial physiologic co-effects we prefer to drugs that simply lower blood sugar or lower blood pressure. Thiazolidine ions like metformin improve insulin sensitivity. Metformin works at the level of the liver, thiazolidine dions in skeletal muscle. There's three thiazolidine dions that are used around the world. One is regulin, trolitazone. This was the first thiazolidine dion to come out in the United States about 10 years ago. As a side effect, it can cause liver dysfunction, which if picked up early is never a problem. But with the initial experience with the drug, American physicians were not aware of this and some people got sick so it was pulled off the market. We now have Avandia and Actos that are insulin sensitizers at the level of the muscle. They, they increase insulin sensitivity at the level of the muscle and they improve endothelial function. Here we have a study of 299 subjects with type 2 diabetes. You're going to optimize their insulin dose over an 8 to 12 week run-in period. You're going to lower their hypertension. You're going to put them on a statin if their LDL is high. So you're going to do your very best to get them all tuned up. You're going to measure their mean common carotid IMT, their standard labs, then randomize them to trolitazone, a thiazolidine or placebo. Then you're going to repeat the baseline studies. And what you find is that overall, the individuals on placebo progress their IMT more rapidly. Individuals with a lower IMT at baseline did worse with triglitazone. Individuals with a greater disease burden did better with triglitazone. So the, more, the greater is your IMT, the greater is your benefit from triglitazone. Those with less disease burden did not benefit at all. In fact, they did a little bit worse with triglitazone. Here's a study of thiosinidiones in non-diabetics with coronary disease. Their blood sugars are normal, and they're not overtly insulin insensitive, but you're going to add in an insulin sensitizer to further improve insulin sensitivity and also capture some beneficial co-benefits on endothelial function that the thiosinidiones will provide for you. 80 non-diabetics with known coronary disease, 95% on a statin, 42% on a beta blocker, and those are two agents that help regress IMT. Record at baseline, their standard risk factors, their mean common carotid IMT, randomized to receive over 48 weeks of Vandia, a thiosolidine diome, or placebo, then you repeat the baseline studies. Glucose didn't change, but again, it was normal to begin with. HOMA, which is a marker of insulin insensitivity, did improve. The standard labs didn't improve. So they weren't diabetic, but they had some insulin insensitivity that was improved with the thiosolidine diome. With placebo group, IMT progressed. With thiazolidine dione therapy, it was stabilized. So there was a benefit on plaque progression, soft plaque progression, with insulin sensitizer therapy. So we're talking about drugs to stabilize the IMT. Lipid reduction is of obvious benefit. We can use cholesterol plus, plus niacin, but statin therapy is more effective and it's actually better tolerated. 
adding niacin to statin is effective and it's especially effective if you're not insulin insensitive, although it will still help you if you're insulin insensitive. And niacin monotherapy has been shown to be effective in the study we presented, even in those with insulin insensitivity, and it's been shown to be effective in individuals who are not insulin insensitive. Probicol is effective in seniors. It's no longer available in the United States, but it may make a comeback as we understand its mechanism of action and can demonstrate its benefits. When we're thinking about blood sugar control, we want to lower your sugar, but it depends how we lower your sugar if we want to get the best benefit with respect to IMT. Sulfonylurea agents, they'll lower your sugar, but they do not have the cardiovascular benefits. As a matter of fact, if you have a heart attack and you're on a sulfonylurea, you're more likely to die than if you're not. They have some negative um, effects on the ability of your heart to handle oxygen um, insufficiency, so I discourage the use of those drugs. Metformin is effective. Thiazolidinediones are effective in non-diabetics and in diabetics with high IMTs. Glyclozide, which is not yet available in the United States, is also effective because it has an antioxidant effect. We previously covered blood pressure control in another section. Beta blockers added to statin therapy alone or with statin therapy are effective. Angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors that are tissue specific. Quinapril and ramipril are effective. Diuretics are not effective. Calcium channel blockers are not effective. So we've talked about pharmacologic approaches to stabilizing the IMT. In the next section, we'll move on and talk about nutritional approaches. In the preceding section, we talked about pharmacologic approaches to stabilizing or even regression in immediate thickness. In this section, we'll talk about nutritional approaches to preventing IMT progression, decreasing your risk of obstructive plaque elsewhere and lowering your risk of future adverse events. First, let's talk about lifestyle changes, calorie restriction. Many individuals who are involved in life extension programs practice calorie restriction because in animal studies, if an animal is fed just enough energy to maintain their weight, they live much longer. So there's a society of individuals who are involved in calorie restriction. Here we're going to look at 18 subjects, mean age 50. They've been on a calorie restrictive diet for six years. They're taking in between 1,100 and 1,900 calories a day. And it's a balanced diet, 26% protein, 46% complex carbs, 28% fats. We're going to measure their IMT, compare that to 18 age match healthy Americans on a typical diet who are taking in 1,900 to 3,500 calories per day. The mean IMT in the group practicing calorie restriction is 0.5. It's 0.8 in the standard diet. Obviously, calorie restriction lowers your risk factors, improves endothelial function, and is associated with far less cardiovascular disease. A mean IMT of 0.5 in a 50-year-old is quite good. Exercise, overweight, and IMT. In, in a preceding section, we talked about how risk factors in childhood, high cholesterol, overweight, can impact on you with an increased IMT later on in life. Here we're going to look at 57 markedly overweight German teens. Their body mass index, weight adjusted for height, was in the top 3% for age and gender. These are really big kids, mean age 19. The control group are 35 age match teens, normal weight, no risk factors of structural heart disease, normal kids. At baseline, you're going to look at standard risk factors, endothelial function, the brachiolarity, flow media vasodilatation, and carotid IMT. Now, with the overweight kids, you're going to randomize them to exercise three days a week, 60 to 90 minutes, or to no change in physical activity. Dieting, calorie restriction, was not encouraged in either group. So these heavy kids either exercise just three days a week or they don't exercise. Flow media vasodilatation, endothelial function, in the normally healthy kids was 11%. It was 5% in the heavy kids. That's not very good. Now, of the overweight kids who were not put on an exercise program, flow media vasodilatation decreases slightly over six months. Whereas it improves, not quite to normal, but it improves significantly from 4 to 8 percent, approaching normal just with exercise. Now, they didn't necessarily lose weight, but exercise by itself 
improves endothelial function. So flow media vasodilatation improved. IMT decreased slightly but significantly in the overweight kids who exercised. It increased slightly in the overweight kids who do not. So if you overweight kids have increased IMT, they have endothelial function. If they just begin to lose that weight, if they just begin an exercise program, endothelial function improves and IMT regresses. Similar findings have been shown in adults. Fit adults who exercise, who can walk farther on the treadmill, their IMTs are lower than sedentary, out of shape adults. So weight control is important, but exercise in and of itself is a benefit. Remember the Mars study, the lovastatin versus placebo study showing that lovastatin lowered the LDL by 75 points and caused significant disease regression. Whereas the placebo group diet alone, there was progression. Now, let's look at the effect of lifestyle in the Mars participants, in the placebo group. 94 of the Mars precipitants were randomized to placebo therapy. Now again, they had coronary disease, at least one artery with 50% narrowing, cholesterol between 190 and 295, 90% men, 37 to 67 years old, 60% were smokers. This group was put on a low cholesterol, low fat diet, but they didn't get lovastatin. Every six months, you look at IMT and do a diet and lifestyle assessment. Were they exercising? Were they watching their weight? What were they eating? Did they stop smoking? Now, mean regression in the placebo group was 20 points a year. 78 experienced progression of 40 points a year. 22% regressed, even though they didn't get the drug, but due to lifestyle changes, they regressed at 30 points a year. So what lifestyle factors made the difference? It wasn't lipid reduction, because lipids didn't fall with diet alone. Something else happened with their lifestyle to cause them to regress, or at least to progress less rapidly. Here we have baseline, here we have change of a number of dietary factors and, and lifestyle attributes. And what they found, the most important effects was a weight loss. Five kilograms per meter squared, which is a 10 to 15 pound weight loss, was associated with regression. Quitting a 10 cigarette per day habit was associated with regression. Reducing cholesterol by 100 points by whatever means associated with the regression with all the above, they regressed 130 points. Now that's of interest because the peak progression in the Mars placebo group was 130 points a year. Those with a number of beneficial lifestyle changes could erase that. So the group mean progression was 20 points per year, but those who really cleaned up their, their lifestyle act actually regressed. So you're never too late to change your lifestyle and get a benefit. Yeah, we may want to give you a drug to lower your cholesterol, but we still want you to stop smoking, to exercise, to lose weight, because these lifestyle changes, which don't cost you a penny, by the way, will all have a dramatic effect, even if you have well-established cardiovascular disease. Antioxidants, we've talked about how the LDL must be oxidized before it can damage the endothelium and increase plaque deposition. So would antioxidant therapy be of value? We know that fins with high selenium levels have protection. What about supplementation? Will that be of value? First, we're gonna start with the subject of antioxidant monotherapy. 146 hyperlipidic men participating in the class study, they all had a prior bypass, mean age of 245. They're randomized to receive diet or diet plus cholesterol and niacin. Now, some of the subjects on placebo, some on drug therapy, were taking vitamin E and, and vitamin C at fairly low doses. Now, the class coronary study demonstrated a benefit with vitamin E. The class subjects who took vitamin E had less progression in their coronary arteries. Now we're gonna look at the effect of antioxidant supplementation on carotid IMT. Now, for the entire group, those that took in more vitamin E progressed less. In the drug group, there was no benefit with vitamin E because the drug effect is so powerful. But those on placebo therapy progressed less. Lowering cholesterol is good. There's less cholesterol to be oxidized. 
taking an antioxidant is good to block oxidation of cholesterol. So we would expect that vitamin E would have a benefit, particularly in individuals whose cholesterol remained high. But this was giving just one antioxidant, which is stupid. Any physician who tells you to take one antioxidant doesn't understand physiology. There are a wide array of different oxidants that want to clobber us. Our body's making free radicals. The drugs we give you cause free radicals. Cigarette smoke, automobile exhaust, um, sunburn is free radical damage. We physicians, when we're treating you, can cause a great deal of free radical stress. Many different types of free radicals seek to oxidize you, compromise your endothelium, and fill up your vessels with plaque. So Mother Nature has designed a comprehensive interlocking antioxidant defense. And the analogy of a football team is, is, is appropriate. There are different antioxidants that will deal with some but not all of the oxidants. So if you take huge doses of vitamin E, but you've got no selenium, you're still going to die of a disease due to free radical stress. It's like having a football team with a couple all-stars and a bunch of guys with broken legs. The other team's gonna find your weak spot and run through. So my job is to coach my patient's antioxidant defense team, make sure that all the positions are filled. We wanna wipe out all the oxidants that wanna cause free radical stress. And in my patients, we can actually measure your antioxidants. We have the SpectraCell study. They take your white cells, stimulate them to divide in tissue culture with or without different nutrients poured into the Petri dish. If your white cells don't divide well until we throw in a specific nutrient, that means you have an intracellular deficiency in that nutrient. So I put everybody on a comprehensive antioxidant program because I know my patients are low in antioxidants and minerals and many other vitamins. And then we'll do the SpectraCell study. And if you have additional deficiencies, say in glutathione or coenzyme Q or selenium, we'll give you additional nutrients. We can actually look at your total antioxidant defense level compared to the rest of the population, supplement you to get it up. We want you in the top 10% of the population. Now, if antioxidant monotherapy helps a little bit, but it's not really rational, because Mother Nature intends us to have a comprehensive antioxidant team. Here's a study of antioxidant combination therapy done by Dr. Salonen. He was the first researcher to study IMT and link IMT to risk factors, oxidants and antioxidants. 522 fins with hyperlipidemia, half men, half women, and half of the subject smoked at least five cigarettes a day. At baseline, you're gonna look at standard risk factors and the common carotid mean IMT. You randomize them to receive vitamin E, 272 units a day, vitamin C, 500 milligrams a day, both or double placebo. Repeat the IMT periodically over the next three years, double blind protocols followed. Now, three year common carotid IMT progression with placebo therapy is 20 points a year. With vitamin E alone, it's 18 points a year. Vitamin C at 17 points a year, but combination therapy is 11 points a year. The antioxidants support one another. Vitamin E, when it is used up, is recharged with vitamin C. It makes sense that combination therapy would be helpful. Iron and cholesterol were associated with more rapid IMT progression. Iron, like copper, is an oxidant. E and C are antioxidants. The combination worked better than the individual antioxidants. If we look at three-year IMT progression in men, in non-smokers, here's placebo, here's E, here's C, here's combination. In smokers, vitamin C didn't, alone didn't help because the cigarette smoke chews up the vitamin C. But the combination of E and C was particularly valuable in smokers. The smokers needed the help and they got a better relative benefit from combination antioxidant therapy. IMT increased by 20 points per year in the placebo group. 5% protection with E alone, 5% protection with C alone, E and C alone, 45% protection. E and C in non-smokers, 30% protection. In smokers, 64% reduction in the rate of disease progression. So this certainly worked well. So they decided to extend the study over years three to six. The placebo subject stayed on placebo 
those who were randomized initially to E, C, or E and C took E and C together. You repeat the mean common carotid IMT periodically for the next three years, you maintain the double blind protocol. And what you find, here are the non-supplemented individuals in black, they're progressing, the group getting E and C, they are not progressing at the same rate and they're leveling out. So the combination therapy was quite effective. Six year, the common carotid artery progression was 0.0134 with placebo, much less with E and C. Those who were compliant with therapy got it even um, less progression. Here, percent reduction in IMT progression versus placebo, overall it's 26%, 30% of those who actually took their vitamins. In men who were compliant, 39%. In women who were compliant, 17%. Those that had plaque at baseline, who are at greater risk of disease progression, there was a 54% reduction. So the greater disease you start with, or if you're a smoker, the greater is your benefit. And this is just two antioxidants. My patients take all the antioxidants with additional antioxidants because we want to work with Mother Nature and have an optimal antioxidant defense. We don't want your LDL to become oxidized. Let's look at the link between oxidized LDL and IMT. 159, 58-year-old Swedish men without diabetes, hypertension, or known cardiovascular disease. You look at their standard lab studies and you measure their oxidized LDL level and their common carotid mean IMT and correlate the lab findings with IMT. And here we have the lowest, the middle, and the highest tercile of, of IMT and you can see that those with the greatest IMT had higher levels of oxidized LDL than those with thinner IMTs. Here we have increasing levels of oxidized LDL that correlate with increased IMT. So the greater your oxidized LDL, the greater will be your IMT. The relationship between oxidized LDL and IMT is stronger than that of regular LDL and IMT because it's the oxidized LDL. We want to block LDL oxidation by removing all oxidants, get rid of heavy metals, and by flooding you with antioxidants. And a tasty approach to anti antioxidant protection might just be pomegranate juice. So I'm going to pause and have a little sip of pomegranate juice to refresh myself. And this tastes better than statin therapy. In this study, we're going to look at 19 Israelis with high grade but still asymptomatic carotid disease. They're 65 to 75 years of age. They had a 70 to 90 percent narrowing on their ultrasound. That's high grade disease, but they weren't symptomatic, so they did not require surgery. 60 percent are on a statin, 60 percent are on an ACE inhibitor, 20 percent on a beta blocker, all that have been shown to stabilize the IMT. 20 percent were on a calcium blocker. At baseline, you do the carotid ultrasound and look at the peak flow velocity, which increases with increasing severity of disease and the IMT in the lab study. You randomize them to pomegranate juice, 55 cc's a day, or placebo. You repeat the lab and ultrasound periodically over one year and over three years in five subjects. You analyze the plaque in three subjects who became symptomatic and required carotid surgery, carotid anorectomy. Now, pomegranate juice had no effect on blood sugar or on cholesterol. However, it did have a powerful and sustained effect on blood pressure. Systolic blood pressure fell from 170 to 143, and it stayed low over the three years of the study. Lipids don't change, sugar doesn't change, blood pressure falls, antioxidants tend to lower blood pressure. They help you make nitric oxide or hold on to your nitric oxide. Antioxidant function improved. Per perioxinase is a circulating antioxidant that's protective against cardiovascular disease. It rose with pomegranate juice. Basal LDL oxidation decreased. Copper-induced LDL oxidation decreased. Remember we talked about how copper oxidizes the LDL and increases your IMT? That phenomenon was blunted in the laboratory and in the, the humans with pomegranate juice because it's a powerful antioxidant. Three patients required surgery. One of the controls in two of the treated patients, the amount of cholesterol in the plaque was less in the group that took pomegranate. Oxidized cholesterol was less in the group that took pomegranate. 
Glutathione is the most important antioxidant in our body. Glutathione levels were greater in the plaque samples of those on pomegranate, and LDL oxidation was blunted. So the antioxidant effect of the pomegranate juice wasn't just present in your circulation, it worked its way into the plaque to protect the plaque from plaque, from plaque rupture. Now, the back to common carotid IMT, which is the subject of this presentation. Here is the baseline, 1.5. That's an increased IMT, which you'd expect in these individuals with high-grade disease. The placebo patients progressed by significantly from 1.52 to 1.65. The patients on pomegranate regressed from 1.5 down to 1. It, their IMT regressed by a third. These are individuals with high-grade carotid disease all you do is have them drink some pomegranate juice every day, profound antioxidant effect, and you're melting away their IMT. Significant reduction sustained with, with pomegranate juice. The percent stenosis that is estimated by the flow velocity, the higher the velocity, the tighter the narrowing fell. The peak systolic velocity fell by 21% at one year, and, in, and the diastolic velocity fell, gains maintained at three years. Endothelial function improved, and the percent stenosis lessened. This is a far better way of dealing with the problem than having surgery. Some people still need surgery, but if you have a significant carotid narrowing, why don't you take a powerful antioxidant like pomegranate and stabilize or regress the narrowing? Another therapy is glycidin, which is a stabilized superoxide dismutase. One-fifth of the protein in your body is superoxide dismutase. That's because antioxidant protection is so important. You can't take human superoxide dismutase. It's degraded in the GI tract. Some smart people found a way to take superoxide dismutase from a melon, stabilize it with gluten so you could ingest it orally. It would not be degraded. So it's a nutritional supplement available through the Life Extension Foundation, LEF, L-E-F, Dot org, lifeextensionfoundation.org. Here's a study carried out in Paris, 34 French men and women in their 40s without known cardiovascular disease, but they were at high risk of future disease. They had a family history of, of coronary disease or stroke. They were overweight. Their LDL is above 140. Their BP is on the high side, and their mean IMT is above 0.7, which is pretty high for a 40-year-old. Three years prior to beginning the study, you put all their meds on hold, and work with them on lifestyle and diet. Three years later, after they've been on the diet and lifestyle modification program, at the beginning of the formal aspect of the study, you look at their antioxidant levels, their lipids, their mean IMT. Randomize them to placebo or the stabilized superoxide dismutase preparation, two capsules a day. Repeat the lab and ultrasound periodically over two years. Now, over the three-year run-in period with lifestyle modification, their body mass index de decreased, they dropped some weight, their systolic fell by six points, their diastolic fell by 10 points, their LDL fell a little bit, their glucose fell, so lifestyle modification does have a benefit here. Now, you begin the formal aspect of the study and evaluate them in 180, 360, and 730 days they either they stay on their, their beneficial lifestyle. One group gets um, placebo, one group gets the stabilized superoxide dismutase. And the nutritional supplement really didn't have any effect on weight or blood pressure or the lipids. Um, it, it really wasn't working within those, uh, those common parameters. But IMT progressed um, at one year by 10 points with placebo therapy, and it regressed with antioxidant therapy. It overall, over, over two years, there was a 3% progression with lifestyle alone versus a 2% regression with lifestyle and antioxidant therapy. Here we have baseline one, one and a half, and two years, slow progression with lifestyle alone, lifestyle modification plus antioxidant, you get regression, similar to the um, benefits of C and E, similar to the benefits of pomegranate juice. So antioxidant protection is uniformly effective. 
Malon dialdehyde is a marker of free radical stress. If your cell membranes are subjected to free radical stress, which is undesirable, your MDA levels rise, they rose with lifestyle alone, they fell with antioxidant therapy. Superoxide dismutase, a powerful antioxidant, the levels rose with supplementation, that was the point. It's a stabilized superoxide dismutase. Glutathione peroxidase, another powerful antioxidant, was spared because you're giving them superoxide dismutase the levels were, were greater. So broad spectrum antioxidant protection was provided. Another dietary study of vitamin C, bioflavonoids, and IMT. 464 Norwegian men, 70 years of age, 26% had known cardiovascular disease, a quarter were on lipid lowering therapy, a third were smokers. At baseline, you're gonna look at their dietary habits, their risk factors, and the mean IMT at the carotid bifurcation. You're gonna randomize them to the Mediterranean diet, which is um, with uh, dietary counseling and they had some coaching to follow the diet or no dietary advice, you repeat the IMT three years later and see if the diet worked. Now the Mediterranean diet is similar to the Lyon diet. 30% of the calories from fat, primarily unsaturated, low cholesterol, complex as opposed to simple carbs, lots of colorful foods, fresh fruits, berries, and vegetables. The pigments in plants are bioflavonoids, which are powerful antioxidants, kind of like pomegranate. Fish, poultry, not a lot of red meat, low-fat cheese, canola and rapeseed oil margarine provided, olive oil recommended. This is the Mediterranean type Lyon diet. And they looked at the change in nutrient content and other lifestyle parameters amongst the subjects. And they found that in both groups, calories, proteins, total fat and carbs, alcohol and calcium decreased. In the diet group, saturated fat, cholesterol, whole and low fat milk and meat decreased more. And in the diet group, bioflavonoids and antioxidants increased. There wasn't a great gross change in total fat or saturated fat. Triglycerides fell more in the Lyon group. HDL rose a little bit more, but these were not gross changes in the lipids. But IMT progressed less. In the control group, they progressed at 21 points per year. In the diet group, they progressed at 15 points a year. And they, they did some, some analysis and they found that the key here was an increase in vitamin C and an increase in bioflavonoids from fruits, berries, and vegetables. And this is similar to the Lyon Heart Study where um, fruits and vegetables, if you would just increase your intake 150 grams a day, one serving, that decreases your cardiovascular mortality by 16%. Risk decreases 4% for each additional fruit and vegetable. Risk decreases 7% for additional fruits. So what your mom and your grandmother told you, fruits and vegetables every day make sense. Colorful fruits and vegetables are rich in bioflavonoids, potent antioxidants, block LDL and cell membrane oxidation, improve endothelial function, lessen progression of IMT, lessen progression of plaque and protect you from events. Another approach that is working quite well to raise glutathione is the LifeWave glutathione patch and you can go to lifewave.com slash CHC. This is an ingenious preparation. This patch contains some molecules in a polyethylene sheath. You place it on your skin. No chemicals leave the patch. If you put it on your skin, your meridian energies, your acupuncture system energies are absorbed by the molecules in the patch and they self-assemble into a crystal structure, a liquid crystal structure, and they become an antenna and they soak up your meridian energies. You place the patch over strategic points on your body that correspond to the glutathione control points within the Chinese acupuncture system. We typically put it right in here at the level of the xiphoid process. No molecules leave the patch, but your own energies are stored and redirected into your meridian system, and it tells your body, using its own biochemical machinery and raw materials, to increase glutathione. And your glutathione levels will triple in several days. If you don't believe me, put on the patch and leave it on for 24 hours. And I guarantee you're gonna feel awful at that point because you're gonna make so much glutathione, you're gonna to begin to detoxify 
heavy metals and pesticides and herbicides, you'll feel rotten. And just try this and you'll see. So what we have people do is wear it six hours the first day, take it off. Wear it a little bit longer each day. After a while, you can wear it all day after you have detoxified. So this is a very um, interesting and powerful means of improving your antioxidant status. They have another patch system that helps you burn fatty acids to generate energy. And athletes do better with the patch. Weightlifters do better. When I run a marathon, you know, it's kind of hard at age 52 to run these 26 mile marathons. I'll take any biochemical advantage I can get. I wore the patches, I thought it was helpful. Okay, let's talk about tocotrienols and carotid stenosis. Vitamin E is tocopherol. Tocotrienols are vitamin E particles with an extra side chain and they are mobile. You could think of tocotrienols as vitamin E on steroids. There are more, they have a stronger antioxidant effect. Here we're going to take 50 subjects with symptomatic carotid disease. They had a tranche ischemic attack or a non-disabling stroke. Their ultrasound and angiogram showed a 15 to 79 percent carotid narrowing. And at the time this study was done, the policy was to operate on a carotid narrowing of 80 percent, but if it was below 80 percent, to receive medical therapy. So these individuals were not felt to require surgery, they were to be treated medically, and they participated in this study. At baseline, you look at lipids, T-bars, which is a marker of oxidative stress, severity of carotid narrowing in four categories, 0 to 15, 16 to 49, 50 to 79, or 80 to 99 percent. You randomize them to receive placebo or palm VT, which is made from palm oil. This study was carried out in Malaysia. So this is a supercharged vitamin E preparation. You repeat the ultrasounds at 6 and 12 months. All standard therapies were permitted except statins were placed on hold. Cholesterol levels fell slightly with placebo. They rose slightly with tocotrienol therapy. So it didn't work by lowering your cholesterol. HDL rose a little bit in both groups. Oxidative stress rose with the placebo therapy. It decreased with the antioxidant therapy, as you would expect. The tocotrienols are powerful antioxidants. They're not designed to lower cholesterol. They're designed to block oxidative stress. So markers of oxidative stress, such as T-bars or malondialdehyde, would fall. Carotid ultrasound, which is what we're really interested in, at six months, 12% of the placebo patients had progressed by two categories. 8% had progressed by one category. Only 4% of those on antioxidant therapy had progressed by one category. None of the placebo patients regressed. 20% of those on antioxidant therapy regressed by one level, 4% by two levels. At 12 months, only 8% of the antioxidant patients had regressed one level. 20% of the placebo patients had progressed two levels, but you see 24% of those antioxidants regressed one level, 4% two levels. This was not a study of IMT, it was a study of gross plaque. And their gross plaque regressed, just as in the Israeli study with pomegranate juice. Had they measured IMT, they would have shown regression of IMT with the tocotrienol therapy. Tea consumption. I drank tea when I was growing up. In medical school, I switched to coffee, but I think I'm going to go back to tea. Here we're going to look at the relationship between tea consumption and carotid plaque in two populations from France. 6,500 subjects greater than 65 years of age living in Bordeaux, Dijon, and Montpelier. This is a three-city three study. And the EVA population, younger individuals aged 59 to 71, scattered throughout France. You're going to look at standard risk factors, diet and beverage preferences, medical history, and you'll do a carotid ultrasound looking at the mean common carotid IMT, the presence of plaque, which is a focal bump in the IMT above one millimeter, correlate the ultrasound findings with the level of tea consumption. And in the three city study of the older subjects, men who did not drink tea, their mean IMT was 0.731. One to two cups a day, 0.724. Three cups a day, 0.714. Similar relationship in women. 
This was not statistically significant, but the direction is showing that tea drinkers have less IMT. If we look at the presence of plaque, there was statistically significant protection. The tea drinkers had less plaque than the individuals who did not drink tea. In the younger population, the EVA study, similar situation, particularly in women. Women who did not drink tea, 19% had plaque. Women who drank three cups of tea a day, 9%. Tea is a powerful antioxidant. Unfortunately, coffee does not provide antioxidant protection. So we should all switch from uh, coffee to tea in the morning, and then throughout the day, we should sip on pomegranate juice. Fish oil. 81 Japanese subjects with adult onset diabetes, none with known coronary disease or peripheral vascular disease. At baseline, you look at their lab, you do a carotid IMT, you randomize them to ethyl ester EPA, which is a double strength fish oil that we use in our own patients, 1800 milligrams a day. That would be equivalent to four to six standard fish oil gel caps or placebo. Reevaluate it two years. And what you find in the um, fish oil group, the hemoglobin A1C rises a little bit. Fish oil can be oxidized if you take it without antioxidants, and that can compromise sugar control. But if you take fish oil with antioxidants, that does not occur. The fish oil raised the HDL from 54 to 61, just as niacin would, and it didn't have any significant effect on cholesterol. Maximal IMT regressed slightly in the control group from 1.71 to 1.69 and dramatically in the fish oil group from 1.51 to 1.33, nearly 200 points. That's a profound reduction in IMT above and beyond what you would get with um, statin therapy and almost as much as you would get with pomegranate juice. Mean carotid IMT progressed with the control therapy, it regressed with fish oil. The yearly change in IMT, 1.3 progression with placebo, 2.4% regression with fish oil. Another study, 64 subjects at risk for cardiovascular disease. They have elevated triglycerides, no known cardiovascular disease. Their triglycerides between 170 and 390. They had a IMT max above 1.3 and a Framingham 10-year risk prediction of 20%. So these people didn't have known disease, but they're at risk. They've got a lot of risk factors. So at baseline, you look at their lab studies, a composite mean of the common, the bifurcation, and the internal carotid. Then you advise them all to follow a prudent diet, randomize them to receive six fish oil capsules, or placebo is olive oil, reevaluated over two years. And with fish oil, triglycerides falls, LDL goes up a little bit. That's another downside of fish oil that's not huge, and HDL rose. Platelet stickiness improved with fish oil. Fish oil will lower your triglycerides, raise your HDL, has a modest effect on cell membrane function, but it keeps your platelets from sticking together, and platelet clots mediate most heart attacks. So fish oil has an aspirin-like effect. It's actually more powerful than aspirin. Progression rate of the mean IMT values was less across the board in the fish oil group than in the placebo group. B vitamin supplementation and IMT. 50 subjects with an elevated IMT, referred for ultrasound scanning. You measure the IMT at, at all three sites, it's above one. So these people are, are going to get into trouble. They have a high IMT. They're at least 60 years of age. At baseline, you measure homocysteine and the IMT. The group mean was 1.48 for the composite. Randomized them to receive over one year folic acid B6 and B12. Folic acid B6 and B12 will stimulate the enzymes of the methyl cycle to metabolize homocysteine. You repeat the baseline studies at one year, double blind protocol followed. Mean homocysteine is 10.6. Normal is considered to be 9. 60% were above 10. Homocysteine level fell in response to B vitamin supplementation. In the placebo group, nothing happens. It falls from 10.5 to 6.6 .6 with B vitamins, as you would expect. IMT progresses significantly from 1.47 to 1.54 with placebo therapy. It regresses significantly from 1.5 to 
4.2 with B vitamin supplementation. 4.2% regression per year versus with placebo, 7.4% progression. Factors associated with reduction IMT was B12 level at baseline and being randomized to therapy. Factors not associated with the reduction IMT, baseline homocysteine level, the degree of reduction in homocysteine. Again, as we're learning about methyl cycle genomics, we're understanding that homocysteine is simply a marker of disordered enzyme function. And the fact that we lowered the homocysteine wasn't really the mechanism by which you got better, but by shoring up deficient enzyme function, we can improve your entire biochemistry. We give a whole uh, presentation on methyl cycle genomics, which is the most exciting and most important um, new approach to uh, uh, improving the health of our patients that we have. The factors associated with an increased IMT or rate of IMT progression have been presented. And in these last two sections, we talked about drug and nutritional programs designed to stabilize or even regress the rate of progression of IMT. Drug therapies that are typically well tolerated, nutritional therapies that are always tolerated, my patients get both because I want to keep my patients out of the hospital and I particularly want to keep you out of the cath lab because I don't want to do any more heart caths and increase my IMT further. Next we'll move on to the summary and an integrative plan of action. We'll close our presentation with a brief summary and an integrative plan of action to deal with your IMT and to decrease your risk of IMT progression and cardiovascular events in general. We presented the IMT as the staging ground for plaque formation. The greater your IMT, the greater the rate at which your IMT progresses, the greater your rate of plaque progression, the greater your risk for an adverse cardiovascular event. Heart attack, the need for revascularization, stroke, or kidney failure. The IMT is the interface between physiology, endothelial function, and anatomy, gross plaque. Your risk factors cause endothelial dysfunction that leads to increased IMT that leads to high-grade narrowings, vulnerability of the plaque, and events. Cardiovascular risk factors affect the IMT. IMT predicts your current risk and future risk. All therapies that have been shown to improve outcome in the patient with cardiovascular disease or to prevent overt cardiovascular disease have been shown to stabilize or reverse intermediate thickness, and they've been shown to stabilize or reverse endothelial function. It's a continuum. Abnormal physiology, increased IMT, which we can conveniently measure, high-grade plaque, cardiovascular events, and death. What are we going to do about this? First thing, get your IMT measured. It costs $225. There's no risk involved, there's no radiation, and it provides a wealth of information. Get your IMT measured. Plug yourself into the studies we've, prevent, we've presented. Compare yourself to your age-matched peers. Are you at the 50th percentile, a typical American? That's okay, but you'd rather be at the 20th percentile. You don't want to be at the 90th percentile. The greater your IMT as a function of your age and gender, the more likely you are to get into trouble. You can predict your individual risk from the studies we presented. So what are you going to do about this? Well, first of all, lifestyle. Regular exercise, weight control, control stress and emotions. You do things to make yourself optimistic. Again, stay in school, get a desk job, Make enough money so you don't have to worry about paying the bills that you can be optimistic. And above all, don't make a living doing heart catheterizations. Undergo a risk factor assessment. With my patients, we plot out and chart all of your risk factors, the standard lipids, lipoprotein A, your antioxidant defenses. In men, we look at free testosterone estradiol. In women, we'll look at FSH and estradiol. 
We will chart your IMT. We look at ferritin, vitamin D, homocysteine, fibrinogen, CRP, magnesium. We look at all the risk factors and seek to control them. Because if we control your risk factors, we can prevent endothelial dysfunction, we can prevent IMT formation and progression, and we can prevent high-grade disease and cardiovascular events. General nutritional intervention. I know that all my patients are low in multiple nutritionals. I don't even bother to measure you. I will first supplement you and then measure you. I recommend a dedicated six-a-day multivitamin. A one-a-day does not have enough good stuff in it. I have my patients take a six-a-day. They take two, three times a day with meals because food causes oxidative stress. You take two tabs three times a day. And a program of essential fatty acids, typically four grams of the omega-3 fish oil and 300 milligrams of the omega-6 GLA from evening primrose oil or borage oil. If we need additional antioxidant protection above and beyond the basics, we can wear the glutathione patch. We can take the life extension um, lecithin preparation. We can drink pomegranate juice. We can drink tea, etc. And we can look for and deal with toxicity. Lead, mercury, cadmium, and arsenic are causing cardiovascular disease, cardiomyopathy, and we didn't get into it, but cancer, because cancer is due to free radical damage, and hydrocarbons, pesticides, and herbicides. We can look for these toxins and remove them from your body. If I could, I'd biopsy every organ in your body and ask, what vitamins, minerals, and cofactors and essential fatty acids does Mother Nature want you to have? If you don't have them, let's give them to you. Then what toxins, hydrocarbons, pesticides, heavy metals, what's present gumming up your biology that's not supposed to be there, let's take it out. Let's clean up your biochemistry that of a healthy newborn baby and then you're not going to get the same disease states that your peers who are not taking these measures will get. In, in patients who are difficult to treat or who are having recurrent uh, problems that don't make sense, we're doing methylcycle nutrigenomic assessment. Um, if you are not my patient and you cannot see me, you could just take Ultimate Cardio Fusion. You can go to the Ultimate Cardio Fusion website, and this was designed to provide bioenergetic support, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory support, and to improve endothelial function. And that concludes our presentation on endothelial function, its causes, its treatments, and a plan of action. We appreciate your attention.